Senate will come to order. Secretary will call the roll. That's right, we're in recess, so no need to call the roll. Uh, but please rise, anyone in the Senate chamber, not too many this morning yet, uh, for the invocation by Reverend Griff Martin of the First Baptist Church in Austin. Thank you, Pastor, for joining us. Please pray with me. God, whom we all know through different names, different paths, and different traditions, but whom hopefully we all experience as love, this Holy Week, you are being celebrated through Passover, through Ramadan, and through Easter. We are reminded in Passover of your call to liberation for anyone power is neglecting or abusing. In Ramadan, we are reminded of your bold call to be prophets, carrying forth your love. And in Easter, we are reminded that there is nothing more powerful or good in our world than love. Remind us of these truths and these holy callings once again. Call and make these elected women and men liberators of those our world forgets and neglects and abuse. Call and make these elected officials bold prophets, speaking truths which create a freer and more equal world for all people. Call and make this assembly a living reminder in our world that love is the only true power and the only love will heal us and bring about your kingdom. And God, if we can't do those things, then forgive us, disrupt us, renew us, and call us again. Our world needs more liberation and love. And what better place for that to begin than right here? Amen and amen. Thank you, Pastor. Great prayer this morning. Thank you. Senator Hancock.
The following message from the governor. The secretary will read the message. To the Senate of the 88th Legislature regular session, I ask the advice, consent, and confirmation of the Senate with respect to the following appointments. To be members of the Texas State Board of Public Accountancy, Kimberly D. Kim Crawford, Arlington, Sherry B. Market Midland, Thomas M. Newhoff, Tyler, Susan M. Warren, Georgetown. Respectfully submitted, Greg Abbott, Governor of Texas, to nominations. Mr. Doorkeeper. Mr. President, there's a message from the House. Admit the messenger. Mr. President, I'm directed by the House to inform the Senate that the House has taken the following action. The House has passed the following measures. HB 727 by Rose. Senator Paxton, you're recognized for a motion to suspend the regular order of business on committee substitute Senate Bill 412. Thank you, Mr. President and members. I move to suspend the regular order of business and take up and consider the committee substitute to Senate Bill 412. This bill improves student and faculty awareness of pregnant and parenting college students' rights to ensure that these students receive the accommodations and protections to which they're entitled to eliminate unnecessary and illegal barriers, barriers to their college education. This uh, helps them to stay in school, finish their degrees, and I'd again like to thank uh, so many of my Senate colleagues for their input on this bill. I move to suspend. Senator Paxton moves suspension of the regular order of business on Senate Bill 412. Is there an objection? Chair hears none. Rules are suspended. Chair lays out on second reading Senate Bill 412. Secretary will read the caption. Committee substitute Senate Bill 412 relating to protections for pregnant and parenting students enrolled in public institutions of higher education. Senator Paxton, you're recognized for a motion. I move passage to engrossment. Senator Paxton's moved passage to engrossment. Is there an objection? 
The chair hears none. Senate Bill 412 is passed to engrossment. Senator Paxton, you're now recognized for a motion to suspend the uh, constitutional three-day rule. I move to suspend the three-day rule. Senator Paxton moves suspension of the three-day rule. Secretary will call the roll. Alvarado, Betancourt, Birdwell, Blanco, Campbell, Creighton. There being 31 ayes and no nays, the, the rule is suspended. The chair now lays out on third reading and final passage, Senate Bill 412. The secretary will read the caption. But he substitute Senate Bill 412, relating to protections for pregnant and parenting students enrolled in public institutions of higher education. Senator Paxton, you're recognized for a motion. Thank you, Mr. President. I move final passage of the committee substitute to Senate Bill 412. Senator Paxson moves final passage of Senate Bill 412. Secretary will call the roll. Alvarado, Betancourt, Birdwell, Blanco, Campbell, Creighton, Necker, Waters, Gutierrez. There will be 31 ayes and no nays. Senate Bill 412 is finally passed. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, members. Senator Zafferini. Senator Zafferini, you're recognized for a motion to spend the regular order of business on Senate Bill 52. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, members, I move to suspend the Senate's regular order of business to take up and consider at this time the committee substitute for Senate Bill 52 relating to the right of state hospital patients to designate an essential caregiver for in-person visitation. Members, in 2021, we passed legislation by Senator Cokehorst providing essential caregivers of persons in nursing homes and assisted living facilities visitation rights. The committee substitute for Senate Bill 52 would simply extend that to state hospitals. Mr. President, I move adoption. Senator Zafferini moves suspension of the regular order of business on Senate Bill 52. Is there an objection? The chair hears none. The rules are suspended. The chair now lays eyes on second reading Senate Bill 52. The secretary will read the caption. Committee substitute Senate Bill 52 relating to the right of state hospital patients to designate an essential caregiver for in-person visitation. Senator Zafferini, you're recognized for a motion. Thank you, Mr. President. I move passage to engrossment. Senator Zafferini moves passage to engrossment. Is there an objection? Chair hears none. Senate Bill 52 has been passed to engrossment. Senator Zafferini, you're now recognized for a motion to suspend the constitutional three-day rule. Thank you, Mr. President. So moved. Senator Zafferini moves suspension of the three-day rule. Secretary will call the roll. Alvarado, Betancourt, Birdwell, Blanco, Campbell, Clayton, Eckhart. There being 31 ayes and no nays, the constitutional three-day rule is suspended. The chair now laid out on third reading and... And final passage, Senate Bill 52. Secretary will read the caption. Committee substitute Senate Bill 52 relating to the right of state hospital patients to designate an essential caregiver for in-person visitation. Senator Zafferini, you're recognized for a motion. Thank you, Mr. President. I move final passage. Senator Zafferini moves final passage of Senate Bill 52. Secretary will call the roll. Alvarado, Betancourt, Birdwell, Blanco, Campbell, Creighton, Eckhart. There being 31 ayes and no nays, Senate Bill 52 is finally passed. Thank you, Mr. President and members. Senator Huffman, you're recognized for a motion to suspend the regular order of business on Senate Bill 1173. Thank you, Mr. President and members. At this time, I move to suspend the regular order of business to take up and consider the committee substitute Senate Bill 1173. Members, currently there is uncertainty surrounding the powers and qualification requirements of varying judicial positions in Harris County. This includes concerns regarding the eligibility for appointment as the Harris County presiding judge, the appointment process for the Harris County Bail Hiring Board, and the lack of qualification requirements for administrative judges. These positions are integral to the judicial system in Harris County and oftentimes have a direct impact on the efficiency of the courts and even public safety. The committee substitutes Senate Bill 1173 clarifies that if a presiding judge is absent for any reason and is unable to preside, the presiding judge may appoint a special judge to serve in their place. The presiding judge may choose a judge who, one, is currently serving as an elected judge on a Harris County court with criminal jurisdiction, 
Two has served at least one full term and has agreed to the appointment. Furthermore, the appointed special judge must meet the same qualifications, powers, and duties as the presiding judge and get final approval from the presiding judge of the administrative judicial region. The bill also amends Harris County's bail hiring board to create more transparency surrounding the board's meetings and decision-making process. Oversight of the board changes from the Harris County Commissioner's Court to the presiding judge for the administrative judicial region. It requires hearing officers to be reappointed following completion of their one-year term rather than allowing them to continue to serve until a successor is appointed. And the hiring board would also be included under the definition of a governmental body, making it privy to the Open Government and Open Meetings Act. Lastly, the bill as a requirement for all administrative judge appointments to get approval from the presiding judge of the administrative judicial region. Members, this legislation will clarify statute and add oversight and transparency to the selection process to ensure that we have the most qualified experienced judges serving in Harris County. I will have a floor amendment members that uh, adds a provision that mi mirrors other counties um, on how the local administrative judge um, of the judicial region that includes Harris County to be selected on the basis of seniority from the district courts, the district judges of Harris County. With that, I move to suspend the regular order of business. Senator Huffman moves suspension of the regular order of business on Senate Bill 1173. The secretary will call the roll. Alvarado, Betancourt, Birdwell, Blanco, Campbell, Creighton, Eckhart, Flores, Gutierrez. There being 27 ayes and four nays, the rules are suspended. The chair now lays out on second reading Senate Bill 1173. The secretary will read the caption. But he substitutes Senate Bill 1173, relaying the appointment of criminal law, hearing officers, and a special presiding judge and associate judges for certain criminal courts. Senator Huffman, you're right. Uh, Members, we have an amendment. You yes. said that, didn't you? Are we ready? Se secretary will read the amendment. Floor amendment number one by Huffman. Senator Huffman on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, this is the amendment I mentioned briefly. Um, this floor amendment simply mirrors what other counties, um, some other counties in the state have. It requires the local administrative judge of the judicial region that includes Harris County to be selected on the basis of seniority from the district judges of Harris County. Again, this ensures that the most experienced judges um, hold this um, important position. And with that, I move adoption of floor amendment number one. Members, the questions on adoption of the amendment. Is there an objection? Senator oh, Senator Eckhart. You like doing that late, don't you? So you're recognized on the amendment. Sorry, I'm actually I'm listening to the amendment as it's rolling out. And so, um, uh, Senator Huffman, uh, with regard to this amendment, th this would uh, make the operation in Harris County the same as the operation of the selection of special judges in other counties? This, the floor amendment? The floor amendment only deals with the selection of who will serve as the local administrative judge of the judicial region of Harris County. That includes Harris County. So our it doesn't go to the other um, presiding judge and so forth. Right, so selected on the basis of seniority from the district judges of all the judicial districts comprised uh, of Harris County. So is this the same methodology in other uh, um, areas or will this be specific to Harris County? There are other counties that have this procedure. I don't have that list of counties in front of me, but this, this, stat, this amendment mirrors the language that is used in some other counties. But this doesn't change the fact that the bill overall uh, uh, creates a circumstance in Harris County unlike other counties where the governor has considerably more control over the selection of a special judge, correct? The gov I don't know if the governor, I don't know that the governor selects who the special judge is in other counties. This, this doesn't affect any powers of the governor. But it does change the governor's involvement in the list of special judges available in Harris County, correct? The governor appoints, my understanding is the governor appoints a regional administrative judge and the governor also would appoint 
judges as courts became open, rather either a new court was created or perhaps a judge retired or resigned. Then the governor has the authority to appoint those judges who would normally hold an elected position, but because of an opening, or the regional administrative judge. So this, this bill does not affect any powers of the governor. All right, and I'm just really just trying to understand the, the operation of this bill. So instead of the presiding judge selecting the special judge, it's the administrative judge of the region who is selected by the governor who must approve the special judge, correct? Who, who must do the final approving, yes. But doesn't make the selection, but has to make the final approving. Thank you. Okay. Sarah West on the amendment. Senator Huffman, in terms of the, this, the amendment, uh, based on seniority from the district judges of all judicial districts comprised of Harris County, what are the judicial districts, if you know, that comprise Harris County? Are the, uh, uh, let me ask, this, let me okay, ask yeah. it this way. All of the judicial districts that comprise Harris County in Harris County? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. It, it's a little confusing, but yes, because we have so many courts, yes. Yes. Members, questions on the adoption of the amendment. Is there an objection? Chair hears none. The amendment's adopted. Chair lays out on second reading. Sir Huffman, you're recognized for a motion. Passage to engrossment. It's very early, Mr. President. I move passage to engrossment of the committee substitute Senate Bill 1173. Sarah Huffman moves passage to engrossment this morning on Senate Bill 1173. Secretary will call the roll. Verado, Betancourt, Birdwell, Blanco, Campbell, Crichton, Eckhart. There being 27 ayes and 4 nays, and committee substitute Senate Bill 1173 is passed to engrossment. Sarah Huffman, you're now recognized for a motion to suspend the constitutional three day rule. So moved. Sarah Huffman moves suspension of the three day rule. Secretary will call the roll. Alvarado, Betancourt, Birdwell, Blanco, Campbell, Craig, and Eckhart. There being 27 ayes and four nays, the, uh, the rules are suspended. The chair now lays out on third reading and final passage, Senate Bill 1173. The secretary will read the caption. Committee substitute Senate Bill 1173, relating to the appointment of criminal law hearing officers and of a special presiding judge and associate judges for certain criminal courts. Sarah Huffman, you're recognized for a motion. I move final passage of the committee substitute, Senate Bill 1173. Sarah Huffman moves final passage of Committee Substitute Senate Bill 1173. Secretary will call the roll. Alvarado, Betancourt, Birdwell, Blanco, Campbell, Craig, Nick. There being 27 ayes and 4 nays, Senate Bill 1173 is finally passed. Thank you, members. Senator Hinojosa, you are recognized for a motion to suspend the regular order of business. Take up and consider Senate Bill 2310. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President and members. Senate Bill 2310 relates to longevity pay for certain prosecutors. Uh, when this 86 legislature passed House Bill 2384 in 2019, it adopted a tiered system of compensation for district judges and felony prosecutors based on longevity. During the process, a third tier at 12 years was abandoned, but the judge's on duty increase of 3.1% at 16 years was adjusted to 5% in 12 years. Uh, felony prosecutors are now seeking parity with judges by inclusion in the 12 year on duty pay provision. Uh, right now they're not included, they're looking for parity so we can keep experience. Uh, Prosecutors are uh, employed and continue working in their profession. So with that, uh, 
Mr. President, I will move uh, we suspend the regular order of business on Senate Bill 2310. Members, Senator Hanahosa moves suspension of the regular order of business on Senate Bill 2310. Is there objection? Hearing and seeing none. Rules are suspended. Chair lays out on second reading Senate Bill 2310. Secretary, read the caption. Senate Bill 2310, relating to longevity pay for certain prosecutors. Senator Hinojosa, are you recognized for a motion? Uh, I move for a passage to engrossment. Members, Senator Hinojosa moves passage to engrossment. Is there objection? Hearing and seeing none, the bill is passed to engrossment. <laughs> Senator Hinojosa, are you recognized for a motion to suspend the constitutional three-day rule? I so move, Mr. President. Member Senator Hosa moves suspension to the three-day rule. Secretary will call the roll. Alvarado, Betcourt, Berkeley, Having 31 ayes, no nays, the rule suspended. Chair lays out on third reading and final passage. Senate Bill 2310. Secretary will read the caption. Senate Bill 2310, relating to longevity pay for certain prosecutors. Senator Hinojosa, are you recognized for a motion? I move uh, final passage of Senate Bill 2310. Member Senator Hinojosa moves final passage, SB 2310. Secretary will call the roll. Alvarado, Betancourt, Birdwood, Blanco. 31 ayes, no nays. The bill is finally passed. Congratulations, Senator Hinojosa. Thank you, Mr. President and members. Senator West, you are recognized for a motion to suspend the regular order of business. Take up and consider Senate Bill 500. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I move to suspend the Senate regular order of business to take up and consider uh, the committee substitute to Senate Bill 500. Members, this is the St. Jude bill. Let me just be real specific about it. Uh, St. Jude and other charities normally have uh, giveaways. And the limit right now, in terms of uh, for a house, is about $250,000. This will increase the limit to $500,000. I'm available to answer any questions that you have concerning this bill. Members, Senator West moves suspension of the regular order of business. Take up and consider Senate Bill 500. Is there objection? Hearing and seeing none, rules are suspended. Chair lays out on second reading Senate Bill 500. Secretary will read the caption. Committee substitute Senate Bill 500, relaying the value of a residential dwelling offered or awarded as a prize at a charitable raffle. Senator West, you're recognized for a motion. Who passes to engrossment? Members, Senator West moves passes to engrossment. Is there objection? Hearing and seeing none, the bill is passed to engrossment. Senator West, you're recognized for a motion to suspend the constitutional three day rule. So move. Senator West moves suspension to the three-day rule. Secretary will call the roll. Alvarado, Betancourt, Berg, well, 31 ayes, no nays. Rule suspended. Chair lays out on third reading and final passage. Committee substitute Senate Bill 500. Secretary will read the caption. Committee substitute Senate Bill 500 relating to the value of a residential dwelling offered or awarded as a prize at a charitable raffle. Senator West, recognized for a motion. Move final passage of committee substitute Senate Bill 500. Members, Senator West moves final passage. Committee substitute Senate Bill 500. Secretary will call the roll. Alvarado, Betancourt, Birdwell, Blanco. There being 31 ayes and no nays, the bill is finally passed. Congratulations, Senator West. Senator Flores, you're recognized for a motion to spend the regular order of business. Take up and consider Senate Bill 1008. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, I move to suspend the Senate's regular order of business to take up and consider Senate Bill 1008. In 2019, Texas passed House Bill 1597, allowing military family students with orders assigning them to Texas to enroll in school before actual arrival, allowing our military family students to participate in high demand programs and classes. Current law only allows military families 10 days after the arrival date of their orders to provide the school district with proof of residence. Many military families are experiencing long lead times to find housing, frequently taking up to 90 days. 
to address the elevated housing market and consequent long lead times, Senate Bill 1008 amends current law to allow military families up to 90 days to provide the district proof of residency. This additional time will hopefully provide relief for the military families of over 165,000 military students in Texas that face so many obstacles with their relocations. Mr. President, I move suspension of the Senate's regular order of business. Members, Senator Flores moves suspension of the regular order of business on, on sub, Senate Bill 1008. Is there objection? Hearing and seeing none, rules are suspended. Chair lays out on second reading Senate Bill 1008. Secretary will read the caption. Senate Bill 1008 relating to establishing residency for purposes of admission into public schools. Senator Flores, you're recognized for a motion. Mr. President, I move passage to engrossment. Members, Senator Flores moves passage to engrossment. Is there objection? Hearing and seeing none. Bill is passed to engrossment. Senator Flores, you're recognized for a motion to suspend the constitutional three-day rule. Mr. President, I move to suspend the constitutional rule that bills be read on three several days. <clears throat> Members, Senator Flores moves suspension of the three-day rule. Secretary will call the roll. Alvarado, Betancourt, Roberto, there Alvarado, being 31 Court. ayes and no nays, the rule is suspended. Chair lays out on third reading and final passage. Senate Bill 1008. Secretary will read the caption. Senate Bill 1008 relating to establishing residency for purposes of admission into public schools. Senator Flores, you're recognized for a motion. Mr. President, I move final passage of Senate Bill 1008. Members, Senator Flores moves final passage, Senate Bill 1008. Secretary will call the roll. Alvarado, Betancourt, Byrne, Webb, There being 31 ayes and no nays, the bill is finally passed. Congratulations, Senator Flores. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, members, on behalf of the military families. Senator Menendez, you're recognized for a motion to spend the regular order of business, take up and consider committee substitute Senate Bill 576. Thank you, Mr. President. I move to suspend the Senate's regular order of business to take up and consider at this time Senate Bill 576. So, uh, Mr. President and members, at first, before I, let, I begin the layout, I want to thank Chair Kokorst for her help on this bill. And, and if you look at the bill, it's a very simple bill. It's just a simple change, but it's one that's going to protect some of our most vulnerable uh, senior citizens in Texas. It's going to require Health and Human Services to add into the definition of exploitation instances where a person has taken money from an elderly individual or a person with a disability and claimed that it was a loan in order to avoid prosecution. By changing the definition, we can prevent instances of people who are taking advantage and exploiting our loved ones. Our committee substitute will eliminate the fiscal note that was originally attached to the bill. The committee substitute emphasizes that caseworkers must include section 32.55 of the penal code, financial abuse of elderly individual when investigating cases of abuse, neglect, and exploitation. With that, Mr. President, I move that we uh, take up and consider 576. Member Senator Menendez moves suspension of the regular order of business on committee substitute Senate Bill 576. Is there objection? Hearing and seeing none. Rules are suspended. Chair lays out on second reading Senate Bill, committee substitute Senate Bill 576. Secretary will read the caption. Committee substitute Senate Bill 576 relating to the reporting, investigation, and prosecution of the criminal offense of financial abuse of an elderly individual. Senator Menendez, you're recognized for a motion. Thank you, Mr. President. I move passage to engrossment. Member Senator Menendez moves passage to engrossment. Is there objection? Hearing and seeing none. Bill is passed to engrossment. Senator Menendez, you're recognized for a motion to suspend the constitutional three-day rule. President, so moved. Senator Menendez moves suspension of the three-day rule. Secretary will call the roll. Alvarado, Betancourt, Berger, Blanc. 31 ayes, no nays. The rule is suspended. Chair lays out on uh, third reading and final passage. Committee substitute Senate Bill 576. Secretary will read the caption. Committee substitute Senate Bill 576 relating to the reporting, investigation, and prosecution of the criminal offense of financial abuse of an elderly individual. Senator Menendez, you're recognized for a motion. Thank you, Mr. President. And members, I move final passage of committee substitute to Senate Bill 576. Members, Senator Menendez moves final passage. Committee substitute Senate Bill 576. Secretary will call the roll. Alvarado, Betancourt, Bird, well, 31 ayes, no nays. The bill is finally passed. Congratulations, Senator Menendez. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, members.
Senator Betancourt, you're recognized for a motion to suspend the regular order of business, take up and consider cons committee substitute Senate Bill 1909. Thank you, Mr. President and members. Um, several times in the election cycle, um, there have been court cases where uh, the, uh, the, the parties involved have not uh, notified the Attorney General before trying to receive a trial restraining order on an election issue. Um, in Harris County, uh, the Attorney General was notified of the, of the situation through outside sources and was had to immediately address the issue by jumping into the a case uh, that was already in front of the Texas Supreme Court. As a result, uh, the, the temporary restraining order, which was granted by a, a local district judge, was overturned by the Supreme Court, uh, and uh, some polls stayed open, some polls did not. So really what uh, the, the uh, Senate Bill 1909 simply requires the Attorney General be notified of temporary restraining order hearings before it occurs in order to be given an opportunity to participate in the proceedings. Uh, the uh, committee substitute clarifies that. So with that, Mr. President and members, uh, I move to suspend the regular order business and take up and consider committee substitute for Senate Bill 1909. Senator Eckhart, for what purpose? To ask the author questions. Do you yield, Thirdly. Senator Betancourt? Senator Betancourt, do you yield? It would yield. She was over here to try to ask me a question. Now I guess I could have a question. You're recognized, Senator Eckhart. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I am so sorry that I was not able to ask these questions before. Um, that, uh, Senator, is the, uh, is the notice required because the Attorney General is representing a party in the action? Uh, well, no, they're, they're representing the state in the action, okay? The, and effectively, the action is generally against the election code or discuss, uh, discovery or uh, uh, litigation point about it. So that's really why the AG is there. And what happens, like in this one case, is that uh, they were not notified, they heard about it, through a third party. Everybody rushes in to a motion to the Supreme Court. The AG is going to be there anyway. So why don't we just make it a, a simple requirement that if you, if you want a restraining order, you just go put them on as the list of interested parties. So that makes sense in the case that you described, but I'm, I'm trying to unpack this a little bit, and I apologize for uh, I'm not being up to speed on this. Uh, when an injunction is requested under the election code, uh, um, who, are, who is the complaining party? Well, if you look at, I'll use, let me use the Harris County example. If you have like two political parties, one of them may say, hey, let's keep the polls open, okay? Um, in this particular case, the judge ex parte even the party's lawyer, that was a, but that's another story to put aside, and did not notify the attorney general. So what happened is, a legal process gets going, there's a there's a initial ruling, it could be any county anywhere, and of course it's gonna be appealed immediately on a rocket docket to the Supremes if it's something significant, and, and the AG gets involved then. And my comment is, let's just, if we're having an election contest, let's just, you know, put down one of the interested parties is the state, and copy the Attorney General, and that way everybody's involved in it up front. That's really all it is. Although, you know, if a party is asking for Injunctive relief that is uh, that is that's pre-trial relief, and the state is not necessarily involved at that point. The party is not the state. Uh, the party is requesting injunctive relief in order to maintain the status quo ante. And so, I'm wondering why not just require? I mean, currently the AG must be notified once they become a party. No, that's the problem. They're not notified. Well, I think courts are required to notify well, if, parties of, well, of let me put this uh, way. contested hearings. At least in this example, they weren't. Okay. Well, perhaps the AG wasn't yet a party. An interested party is different from a party in a lawsuit. Well, I think because of the... Uh, because of this, the level of discussion that occurs over election items, and the, and these are very quick appeals to the Supremes, 
I think that this makes sense that we just notify the state if there's injunctive relief to leave the, like to have the polls open. And that way we just get everybody on the same page quickly because we're going to come to some legal ed ruling at the end and it's going to be appealed all the way up to the Supreme Court. So this is just a prevented, just to keep everybody on the same communication cycle because it's going to happen very quickly anyway. So the, the civil attorney for the county, irrespective of what their title is, uh, will be aware of this injunctive relief that's being requested. And right. if that civil attorney uh, needs assistance from the attorney general's office, won't the civil attorney reach out to the attorney general's office? Well, they didn't in this case, but I, this, I think of, from a standard best practices, to if you're going to have an... Uh, uh, injunctive relief of this discussion, like keeping the polls open in the third largest county, which is like the size of the 26th state in America, that's not an insignificant discussion. So all this bill does is just say, notify, if you're going to file this, just notify the attorney general so that the state is notified. That's all. Thank I you th for clarifying it. I okay. appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Members, Senator Betancourt moves suspension of the regular order of business. Is there objection? Hearing and seeing none. Rules are suspended. Chair lays out on second reading. Committee substitute Senate Bill 1909. Secretary will read the caption. Committee substitute Senate Bill 1909 relating to requiring notice to the Attorney General in an action under the election code seeking a temporary restraining order. Senator Betancourt, you're recognized for a motion. I move passage of the committee substitute of Senate Bill 1909 to engrossment. Members, Senator Betancourt moves passage to engrossment. Is there objection? Hearing and seeing none. Bill is passed to engrossment. Senator Betancourt, you're recognized for a motion to suspend the constitutional three-day rule. Mr. President, I move to suspend the constitutional rule that bills be read on three several days. Members, Senator Betancourt moves suspension of the three-day rule. Secretary will call the roll. Alvarado, Betancourt, Burr, Burr, Blanco. There being 30 ayes and one nay, the rule is suspended. Chair lays out on second reading, or I'm sorry, third reading and final passage. Committee substitute Senate Bill 1909. Secretary will read the caption. Committee substitute Senate Bill 1909 relating to requiring notice to the Attorney General in an action under the election code seeking a temporary restraining order. Senator Betancourt, you're recognized for a motion. Thank you, Mr. President. I move final passage of the committee substitute to Senate Bill 1909. Members, Senator Betancourt moves final passage. Committee substitute Senate Bill 1909. Secretary will call the roll. Alvarado, Betancourt, Bird, Bird, Blanco, there Campbell. Being 30 ayes and one nay, the bill is finally passed. Congre Senator Betancourt. Thank you, Mr. President and members. Senator Kokosh, you're recognized for a motion to spend the regular order of business, take up and consider committee substitute Senate Bill 1040. Thank you, Mr. President. I move to suspend the Senate's regular order of business and take up and consider at this time committee substitute to Senate Bill 1040. Members, uh, in the 87th session, the Texas legislature passed SCR 3 by Senator Paxton, which resolved that the 87th legislature of the state of Texas condemns China's practice of involuntary organ harvesting. In addition, SCR 3 resolved that the 87th legislature encourages the medical community to educate Texans about the risks of traveling to China for organ transplants to prevent the Texas residents from unknowingly involving themselves in forced organ harvesting. Lastly, SCR 3 resolved that the 87th legislature urges the United States Congress and the U.S. President to pass laws that prohibit collateral collaboration between the U.S. medical and pharmaceutical companies with the Chinese counterparts linked to forced organ harvesting. I want to thank Senator Paxton for this impactful SCR. We actually took that committee hearing in the Betty King room. It was after 10 o'clock at night. And we had a number of, um, I believe they were uh, Uyghur Muslims that had stayed to testify. They had interpreters. And I was so moved by that testimony that we continue to investigate this. And so, Senator Paxton, I want to thank you and Chair Alverson, who is carrying this companion, Representative Jatan, Representative Bojani, for joining me in a press conference after we heard this bill in uh, Senate Health and Human Services. As I looked around as those that testified, again, many of them with, with interpreters, 
there was not a dry eye among those that were listening on the Senate floor. At one point I looked up, and in solidarity, those that had traveled stood up while their colleagues testified in that hearing. They stood in silence and in reverence. And so I thank you, Senator Paxton, for your lead on this. Because for the past two decades, the Chinese government has been engaged in the vile practice of forcibly removing human organs for transplant. In June 2019, the Independent China Tribunal announced its findings that China has practiced systemic forced organ removal from prisoners of conscience. It is believed that the organs may have been harvested from hundreds of thousands of incarcerated people, mainly Falun Gong practitioners, but also possibly Tibetan Buddhist, house church Christians, and members of the Uyghur Muslim ethnic minority. China has welcomed what has been deemed as transplant tourism, where individuals who are critically in need of an organ travel to China and pay thousands of dollars for one of the 60 to 90,000 transplant surgeries each year. Sobering that this is happening in 2023. So members, um, Senate, committee substitute to Senate Bill 1040 is intended to combat the awful practice of forced organ harvesting, which has become known as transplant tourism. In the United States, the organ donation system has high ethical standards. In Texas, we celebrate those who voluntarily give life through organ donation. Unfortunately, some countries do not respect life in a similar manner. The primary intention is to prevent Texans from unknowingly becoming complicit in forced organ harvesting. The bill achieves this by prohibiting health benefit plans from paying for organs that originated in countries where the risk is extremely high that organs will have come from this illicit source. The bill would prohibit paying for expenses related to organ transplants, procedures, or recovery if the organ is known to have originated in a country with a government that funds, sponsors, or otherwise facilitates forced organ harvesting. The bill will allow the Commissioner of the Department of State Health Services to add additional countries to the list that fund, sponsor, or otherwise facilitate organ harvesting. Thank you for this moment that I was able to uh, bring an awareness to this. I was stopped by a county court at law judge this weekend when I was at an event. And he said, I saw your Facebook post. And he said, I had no idea that this was going on. So I want to thank my colleague and friend, Senator Paxton, for bringing that uh, SCR forward on a very late night in the Betty King room to bring the awareness. And as we move forward, maybe we can stop this heinous practice. With that, Mr. President, I move to suspend the regular order of business. Senator Paxton, for what purpose? To ask the author a question. Do you yield, Senator Colcourse? I do. You recognize Senator Paxton? Thank you, Mr. Uh, President. Senator Colcourse, will you ever forget that night? I will not. I will not. And I'll be honest, uh, we had had a long day on the floor, and all of those people had stayed. And I was like, oh, my goodness, it's just an SCR. Let's move on. And, you know, the good Lord um, has a way of slowing us down and saying, stop, listen, be still, because something really big here is happening. And so the awareness of what uh, is going on and their descriptions, again, when we had Senate Bill 1040, their descriptions of concentration camps and prisons and imprisonments uh, of what would be innocent people in our country, the freedom to practice your religion as you want, that you're not uh, an ethnic minority and being forced to be in so many ways a slave, and then your organs being tested. I will say too, or being taken. They talked about how um, your blood is taken and how all of these things are taken so that they know what your match is gonna be. Well, and of course we know here in the United States that when you're awaiting an organ transplant, you go on to a wait list. And then when an organ becomes available, it's something that happens very suddenly and things start moving very quickly. 
It should tell everyone when you can schedule a transplant in China that something is wrong with that, with that practice. Um, you know, that, that night was the culmination uh, with some of my constituents who had reached out to others that they knew. Um, many of my constituents are practitioners of Falun Gong. And one of the things that is um, in common with these uh, folks, they're religious people, they're people of conscience, and, and they have very, very healthy lifestyles. And so that makes them ideal for organ transplants, which is a very sick thing to think about, that that's, that's the reason you're selected. And, and in addition to that, of course, um, the fact that they have a faith um, and something to which they're more loyal to than their government, uh, a higher power that they, that they follow is um, condemnable uh, to the Chinese uh, Communist Party. And so um, I, I remember to, um, and I just wanted to note this, and we talked about this in the press conference, but the courage of these folks here um, to speak out about this is really difficult to explain, but they do so knowing that they may be identified and their family members who are back home may be identified and persecuted even more than they already are. And so they're willing to do it in order to stop this horrific practice. Um, I was honored to be part of the SCR um, at really their leadership because they brought it to my attention. But I'd appreciate you taking the baton and taking it to the next step. Thank you, Senator Kolkhorst. I, I uh, thank you for that, uh, Senator. I also want to say the Minaret Foundation, of which the executive director uh, lives in Fort Bend County, is my constituent, uh, was here for the press conference as well, and they uh, brought some of the uh, Muslim Uyghurs. I represent a great uh, deal of Muslims, and uh, they are being persecuted in China. And so I stand in solidarity with them. Uh, against this. I want to thank Representative Bojani who came over here and has been so supportive. Again, Dr. Alverson, Representative Chair Alverson will be carrying this in the House and uh, I think again it will bring awareness uh, as I've learned so many people did not know this was going on and I didn't before you brought it forth. So uh, thank you for that and um, so with that, uh, Mr. President, before I suspend the regular order of business, I will say I want to thank my staff for the tremendous work that they did. Grant McLaughlin, Maureen uh, on this bill and working with so many people. Um, I'm, I'm grateful. This is an impactful bill uh, to bring to light uh, what is going on in our world in the year 2023. Member Senator Kokos moves suspension of the regular order of business. Is there objection? Hearing and seeing none. Rules are suspended. Chair lays out on second reading. Committee substitute Senate Bill 1040. Secretary will read the caption. Committee substitute Senate Bill 1040 relating to health benefit plan coverage of a transplant of an organ that originated from or is transplanted in a country known to have participated in forced organ harvesting. Senator Kolkhorst to recognize for a motion. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I move passage of committee substitute Senate Bill 1040 to engrossment. Member Senator Kolkhorst moves passes to engrossment. Is there objection? Hearing and seeing none, the bill is passed to engrossment. Senator Kolkhorst, to recognize for a motion to suspend the constitutional three-day rule. So moved. Member Senator Kolkhorst moves suspension of the three-day rule. Secretary will call the roll. Alvarado, Betancourt, Doug, There being 31 ayes and no nays, the rules are suspended. Chair lays out on third reading and final passage. Committee substitutes Senate Bill 1040. Secretary will read the caption. Committee substitutes Senate Bill 1040 relating to health benefit plan coverage of a transplant of an organ that originated from or is transplanted in a country known to have participated in forced organ harvesting. Senator Kolkhorst to recognize for a motion. I move final passage of committee substitute to Senate Bill 1040 and remember all of those that have been forced to give up their organs and have given their lives um, in this heinous practice. Members, Senator Kolkhorst moves final passage. Committee substitute Senate Bill 1040. Secretary will call the roll. Alvarado, Betancourt, Doug There being 31 ayes and no nays, the bill is finally passed. Congratulations, Senator Kolkhorst. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, members. Chair recognizes Senator Zaffrini for an introduction.
Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President and members, it was my pleasure to author Senate Resolution 393, recognizing April 6 as Tejano Day at the State Capitol. Today's activities were organized by an outstanding group, the Texas Association of Mexican American Chambers of Commerce, also called TAMAC. We welcome this opportunity to recognize the pivotal role the Hanos have played in our state's history and the noble cause to which they have tirelessly dedicated themselves to build a better Texas. The Hanos comprise a diverse and vibrant community whose members have and continue to shape our state's trajectory. From independence movements, battlefield heroics, and distinguished military service, to intellectual innovations, artistic prowess, and culinary inventions, their contributions capture the essence of Texas. The Hanos also have been key figures in the fight for social justice and equality for all, including heavy involvement in pivotal spheres such as politics, civics, education, and women's rights. These efforts have brought the core ideals of our state to life and allowed Texas to flourish. The rich and storied histories they share will only compound with time, including those of Jose Antonio Navarro, Jose Francisco Ruiz, John J. Herrera, and countless others forever enshrined in our state's collective mem memory. Members, they were here to celebrate the Hano Day on the South Lawn, but because of the bad weather, those activities, including mariachis and ballet folklorico, have been canceled. But joining us is a delegation in the North Gallery that includes Pauline Anton, President and CEO of the Texas Association of Mexican American Chambers of Commerce, and J.R. Gonzalez, Executive Vice Chair, Cortland Trion, Volunteer. I'd ask the volunteers to please stand and be recognized and welcomed as we celebrate the Hano Day at the Texas Capitol. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Safarini. Thank you for joining us today. Senator Campbell. <laughs> Senator Campbell, you're recognized for a motion to suspend the regular order of business, take up a consider committee substitute Senate Bill 130. Thank you, Mr. President and members. I move to suspend the Senate's regular order of business to take up and consider a committee substitute bill Senate Bill 130. This bill codifies the Third Court of Appeals decision that local paid leave ordinances are unconstitutional because they violate the Texas Minimum Wage Act. And with that, I move suspension. Members, Senator Campbell moves suspension of the regular order of business. Take up, um, is there objection? Senator West, you are recognized, or for what purpose? Question of the author. Senator Campbell, do you yield? Yes. You recognize Senator West. Let's slow down a little bit. So uh, what this bill does is, is about what again? I, I'm trying to go through all these bills now. What is the Put bill about? Glasses. Put your glasses. Yes, sir. All right, so what is, what is the bill about again? Remember when some, some uh, bigger cities were trying to um, mandate local ordinances such as predictive schedules, sick leave, mandate private business that they had to offer certain benefits. That was challenged by the Third Court of Appeals. I mean, it was challenged, then it went up to the Third Court of Appeals. Third Court of Appeals said, no, that's, those benefits and perks are viewed as minimum wage benefits. They're part of the Minimum Wage Act. That can only be controlled by the legislature, or which is controlled by the legislature. So rendered the municipalities uh, that they could not apply their ordinances onto small businesses, private businesses. They can do it for their, their city employees. They just can't, they just can't tell small businesses that you have to have anything that is re regarded as a perk or a benefit. And this bill simply codifies what the third court of appeal did. Is, has, is the case been appealed to anything? It went to the third court. I think it was, did it, did it, it tried to go up to the 
Texas Supreme Court, just looking at my staff, it was taken to the Texas Supreme Court. They have not rendered an opinion, leaving the third court. So is it still, I mean, is it, I, I, my question is, is it still in litigation? Is it still in the appellate process, appeals process? I think it is not. It's not still in the appeals process, is it, Kerry? No. All right, thank you. Thank you, Senator West. Senator Johnson, for what purpose? Short question of the author. Senator Campbell, do you yield? Absolutely. You are recognized, Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Campbell, uh, you know that there are people who earn very little money and who are going to have a very hard time making it if they're sick and miss a few days, right? Yes. And, and I have no doubt that you're sympathetic to their plight. Yes. Does the state do anything as a state to try to address the problem that these municipalities are trying to address through these uh, mandatory sick leave laws? The state sets the minimum wage. But the state doesn't have a sick leave program, right? For our employees? For, for any... For the th state There's there no state requirement that employers provide sick leave, for one thing, right? Not for private business. And like you, I get a little bit nervous when we start imposing upon businesses to ensure every aspect of the welfare of people. Correct. But I also recognize, just like you do, that there are people who are in dire straits sometimes because of illness. And if the state could do something, either through the Texas Workforce Commission uh, or some other entity, to try to implement a program that would take the pressure off of employers for taking care of employees, but recognizing that people need help getting by, that would be a great move by the state. And then I'd be super comfortable having a preemption law that prevented cities from enacting these programs. So I'm hopeful that if this bill passes and we stop cities from requiring employers to take care of people, that maybe you and I, maybe other people in this body and that chamber can work with the state to try to see if there's a way we can take that burden off of employers but alleviate the problem that employees face when illness strikes somebody who's just barely making it. Well, I, I hear what you're saying. I am sympathetic to folks who don't have those benefits, but I am not in favor of even the state government coming in and giving, um, making up for the lack that they have because of an illness. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not for that. I'm not for the state coming in and providing that. I mean, we've got unemployment. If they get unemployed, we help with that. But businesses also pay into that. Well, I'll, I'll skip my third reading comment and just say that where I, I recognize your, your, the importance of not imposing too much on businesses to take care of everybody, but we also have to have employees. And I would be much more sympathetic to preemption preempting cities from taking action if the state itself would take action. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, Senator uh, Johnson. Members, the motion before us, Senator uh, Campbell moves suspension of the regular order business. There is objection. Secretary will call the roll. Alvarado, Bettencourt, Birdwell, Blanco, Campbell, Creighton, Edward. There being 20 ayes and 11 nays, the rules are suspended. Chair lays out on second reading Committee substitute Senate Bill 130. Secretary will read the caption. Committee substitute Senate Bill 130 relating to the regulation by a municipality or county of certain employment benefits and policies. Senator Campbell, you're recognized for a motion. I move passage to engrossment. Members, Senator Campbell moves passage to engrossment. There is objection. Secretary will call the roll. Alvarado, Betancourt, Birdwell, Blanco, Campbell. There being 20 ayes and 11 nays, the bill is passed to engrossment and will hold there, Senator Campbell. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, members.
Senator Flores, you're recognized to spend the regular order business committee substitute for Senate Bill 1237. Thank you, Mr. President and members. I move to suspend the regular order of business to take up and consider Senate Bill 1237. Currently, commissioned peace officers employed by the Comptroller of Public Accounts are in salary schedule B of the State of Texas Position Classification Plan. Committee substitute for Senate Bill 1237 would add commissioned peace officers employed by the Comptroller to salary schedule C of the plan. The Comptroller's peace officers enforce the state tax code in all 254 counties and make felony arrests relating to violations of the tax code each year. Adding them to Schedule C will provide salary parity to similar positions at other state agencies. I move suspension of the Senate's regular order of business. Any objection, members? Hearing none. Rules are suspended. Chair lays on second reading. Committee substitute for Senate Bill 1237. Secretary, read the caption. Committee substitute Senate Bill 1237 relating to compensation and leave for certain security officers or investigators commissioned as peace officers by the controller. You recognize on passage to engrossment. Thank you, Mr. President. I move passage to engrossment. Any objection? Hearing none. Bill passed to engrossment. You recognize to suspend the constitutional three-day rule. Senator, you recognize to suspend the constitutional three-day rule. Thank you, Mr. President. I move to suspend the constitutional rule that bills be heard on three several days. Secretary, will call the roll. Alvarado, Ben 31 Cardinal. ayes and no nays. Rule suspended. Chair lays out third reading and final passage. Committee substitute for Senate Bill 1237. Secretary, read the caption. Committee substitute Senate Bill 1237 relating to compensation and leave for certain security officers or investigators commissioned as peace officers by the controller. You're recognized on final passage. Thank you, Mr. President. I move final passage. Secretary, will call the roll. Alvarado, Betancourt, Birdwell, Blunt. If they were all only that easy, Senator, 31 to nothing, the bill's finally passed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, members.
Senator Hancock, you're recognized to spend the regular order of business so on committee substitute for Senate Bill 1114. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. I move to spend the regular order of business and take up and consider committee substitute to, to Senate Bill 1114 at this time relating to the authority of a political subdivision to regulate the use of sale of a product for purpose of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the bill will prohibit local governments from adopting or enforcing emissions reduction policies on rules that unfairly prohibit the re and restrict the use of sale of legal products. Uh, a growing number of local governments are considering measures that restrict the use and sale of uh, some products in the name of environmentalism, unnecessary burdening businesses, especially small businesses and residents alike. The bill would afford Texans the same right to own, use, and sell product by ensuring greenhouse gas emissions reduction policies adopted by local government don't unfairly ban, ban uh, legal products. I move suspension. Any objection? Probably. Secretary, call the roll. Alvarado, Bettencourt, Birdwell, Bronco. 25 ayes, 6 nays, rules are suspended. Thank you, Senator West, for speaking up. The chair lays out in second reading. Committee substitute for Senate Bill 1114. Secretary, read the caption. Committee, committee substitute Senate Bill 1114 relating to the authority of a political subdivision to regulate the use or sale of a product for the purpose of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. You're recognized. Passage to engrossment. Passage to engrossment. Secretary will call the roll. Alvarado, Bettencourt, Birdwell, Blanco, Campbell. 25 ayes, 6 nays. The bill passed to engross me. You recognize to spend the constitutional three-day rule. So moved. Secretary will call the roll when ready. Alvarado, Bettencourt, Birdwell, Blanco, Campbell. 25 Curry. ayes, 6 nays, the rule is suspended. The chair lays out third reading and final pass. Committee substitute for 11 Bill 1114. Secretary, read the caption. Committee substitute Senate Bill 1114 relating to the authority of a political subdivision to regulate the use or sale of a product for the purpose of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. You recognize the final. I move final passage. Alvarado, Bettencourt, Birdwell, Blanco. 25 ayes, 6 nays. The bill is finally passed. Thank you, Senator.
Senator Betancourt, you recognize spend the regular order business on Senate Bill 1907. Thank you, Mr. President. The uh, Texas Election Code requires that election records shall be delivered no later than 24 hours after the polls close in each election. Unfortunately, in Harris County, in the elections of 2022, the results were not immediately available even after the 24-hour time period. Um, it, it started in the primaries where 10,000 mail-in ballots were displaced and not counted even after a court case uh, where the then election administrator claimed that they had been counted and those results were released after the newscast on Saturday night. Um, and in addition, uh, same issue occurred in the uh, in the, the general election. So basically what Senate Bill 1907 uh, does is just it allows uh, for oversight from the Secretary of State to be able to uh, state authority to come in and supervise the counting preparation of election returns and distribution of records if those results aren't delivered within 24 hours after the close. It, SB 1907 would ensure that the election records are properly prepared and delivered to Central County Station if necessary. With that, I move suspension of the regular order of business to take up and consider Senate Bill 1907. Secretary, recall the roll. Alvarado, Betcourt, Birdwell. 19 ayes, 11 nays. The Rules suspended. Chair lays out in second reading. Senate Bill 1907. Secretary, read the caption. Senate Bill 1907 relating to preparing and delivering precinct election returns. You recognize on passage to engrossment. Thanks, Mr. President. I move passage to engrossment for Senate Bill 1907. Secretary will call the roll. Alvarado, Betancourt, Bordwell. 19 ayes, 11 nays. We'll hold right there. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Mr. President.
Senator Hancock, are you ready? You're recognized to spend the regular order of business on committee substitute for Senate Bill 1249. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. I'm going to spend the regular order of business and take up and consider Senate Bill 1249 at this time relating to the establishment of a living organ donor education program. What few people realize is that more than 85% of the 100,000 plus people who are on the national transplant wait, waiting list today are waiting for a kidney or another 11% or or of patients are waiting for a liver. That means an, an astounding 96% of organ donations uh, are needed to save lives could come from living donors. Uh, and Senate Bill 1249 will create a live donor uh, recruitment program and development of relating informational materials for Texans in partnership with Donate Life Texas to learn how to become a living donor and raise awareness about the overwhelming need for organ donation. Um, and as a matter of um, business, I had left uh, here just a little while ago to do an interview with my son-in-law who donated his kidney to me uh, before coming back and laying out this bill. So your timing's excellent, Mr. President. With that, I move suspension. You know I had that plan, of course. Uh, any objection hearing none? The rules are suspended. Chair lays out on second reading committee substitute for Senate Bill 1249. Read the caption. Committee substitute Senate Bill 1249 relating to the establishment of a living organ donor education program. You know, Senator, a lot of the time we have people who have expertise on issues. You surely are the person to carry this bill. You're recognized on passage to engrossment. Uh, th thank you, Mr. President. I move passage to engrossment. Any objection? Hearing none, bill passed to engrossment. You recognize to spend the constitutional three-day rule. I move to spend the rule that bills be read on three several days. Secretary will call the roll. Alvarado, Betancourt, blah, blah, blah. 31 ayes, no nays. The rule is suspended. Chair lays out in third reading and final passage. Committee substitute for Senate Bill 1249. Secretary will read the caption. Committee substitute Senate Bill 1249 relating to the establishment of a living organ donor education program. You recognize the final passage. Thank you, Mr. President. I move final passage. Secretary will call the roll. Alvarado, Betancourt, Bergwell. 31 ayes, no nays. Bill is finally passed. Thank you.
Senator Betancourt, you're recognized on Senate Bill 1950. It was a good year to spend a regular order of business. <laughs> some, some, some better years than others, Mr. President, but 1950 was a good year for you. Um, the uh, Texas legislature set up eight criteria for signature verification on early uh, ballot boards to review mail-in ballots, carrying envelopes to determine whether or not to accept or reject mail-in ballots in Texas. The eight criteria include the envelope must be properly executed, neither signature on the application or carrier envelope is determined to be that of another person, and identification number on the envelope matches the identification number of the voter registration application. It's pretty simple and straightforward. Um, in Harris County, unfortunately, the Signature Verification Committee was instructed uh, to only compare the ID number on the envelope to the ID number of the mail-in ballot application, and they were also instructed not to compare signatures, which is clearly against the law. Uh, so basically what Senate Bill 1950 does is make it clear that we're going to keep... Um, uh, these signature verifications at the paramount part of democracy and it would prohibit the county clerk, election administrator, early voting clerk, or early balloting board member from suspending the requirements of 1887.041B and creating an offense of a Class C misdemeanor. Mr. President, I move suspension of the regular order of business to take up and consider Senate Bill 1950. Senator Miles, what purpose? Questions to the author, Mr. You? President? Certainly. Uh, Senator Betancourt, um, can you explain to me the circumstances currently allowed on the suspending of the requirements related to the acceptance of the early vote ballot by mail? Uh, sorry, Senator Miles, I didn't hear you. What are the circumstances currently allowed for the suspending requirements related to the acceptance of the early, uh, the early vote, voting ballot by mail? Uh, Senator Miles, unless there's a court order, I don't know how to suspend that one segment of the uh, of the election code. Okay, and is it, is changing this bill acceptable to lead expected to lead to an increase in mail ballots being rejected? Uh, it's expected to lead to the law being followed above the eight criteria that determine very simple things like matching the signature verification. Uh, none of those should have been suspended in Harris County uh, because this is, we've got a clear outline procedure in the code, Senator, that just compares signatures. You have to make sure you've got the right ID number, uh, et cetera. Um, and, and so this bill just says don't suspend what was already in law. And I agree with you. And how many times does the signature need to be verified under this legislation? Um, under well, your legislation, how many times will we be verifying signatures? Well, the current law says it needs to be verified every time. I mean? Every time. The every signature, time. Right. That, so, that's, that's what the current law says, and all this says is that uh, you can't suspend that requirement. So you don't see it being multiple times under this, adding some more times for it to be verified? No, because if because the original what the law said was to do it every time, and that's what every county is doing, supposedly every time, except that when an election administrator decides to suspend the code unilaterally, uh, and that shouldn't happen for any reason. For any reason, it's, Senator Bencourt, you're aware that in the hearing for this bill, the women from Baxter Cap from Bear County who was testifying in favor of your bill stated that there were that they were acting under the directions of the Secretary of State. Were you aware of that? Um, no, I don't remember that, but I, it, uh, Senator Miles, but... You take my word for it? Oh, well, if, if, to proceed with, the, proceed with the argument, please go ahead. <laughs> take my word for it. Take my word for it. I wouldn't lead you wrong, Senator okay. Bedford. Um, what happens if the election administrator is acting under the discretion in the directions of a Secretary of State? Um, the Secretary of State can't suspend this requirement either. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure they can't. Unless there's, again, unless there's some type of court order involved, I, there's, I don't see how the, uh, the Secretary of State or any election administrator could suspend those eight requirements. Under your bill? Right. Well, you mean under current law right now. I mean, that's, that, I don't see how that's possible. Okay. Does the Class A misdemeanor apply to county staff or volunteers working on behalf of a county clerk, elections administrator, or early vote 
an early vote clerk? Uh, it would apply to any of the following. The county clerk, elections administrator, early voting clerk, or early ballot board uh, from suspending the requirement. So what the bill does is, is for those four individuals, you just simply can't suspend the law. That's really what this is. And if you suspend the law, uh, you, there's a higher criminal penalty. A higher class A misdemeanor is higher, right. correct? Right. Okay. <laughs> And if someone, so if someone is working under the, under the direction of the state's chief election office, they can be charged with a crime equal to an assault under this bill. Well, Senator, it's uh, important that we have election code for a reason. We've gone through best practices. We know that when you receive an, er, uh, 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 well, let me finish. Okay, that'll get, give it back to you. If you get an, er, uh, an application in, you've got to do signature verification. Uh, you have to make sure that you're dealing with the same person uh, on both sides. So and my answer is that, uh, that, uh, that no one in the code unless there's some type of emergency order backed up with us, some, some type of judicial order, they, the Secretary of State, none of these people can suspend the election code. I just want to repeat, under this bill, uh, make sure you understand, if someone is working under the direction of the state chief election office, they can be charged with a crime equal to an assault under this bill, well, 1950. unless some bills pass in the House, there is no way for the Secretary of State to tell anybody. They, they only have an advisory capability uh, at this point in time. There is no one that works under them from the county position yet. So, so the answer would be they can't say it and the other people can't do it. And you're aware that in Harris County, we're, fi we're, we're finding it hard to even find people to work the elections these days. Well, I, unfortunately, um, with the chaotic jumble of what happened, I understand why. But part of it is that they're not following the election code. And if they follow the election code, a lot of this won't happen. Uh, the reason why there's 21 election challenges in Harris County is because they're not following the election code. We'll see what the courts do with them, but we know they're going to trial, or at least a, a good chunk of and, them. Are and the other side of that is bills like this, that when they do try to volunteer and help the service, they got to be in fear of going to jail for doing something they know nothing about. Thank you, Senator Betancourt. I'll be always, voting against this bill. And always enjoy the discussion. Secretary will call the roll on the suspension. Alvarado, Betancourt, Gergler, Blanco. 19 ayes, 12 nays. The rule is suspended. Chair lays out on second reading. Senate Bill 1950. Secretary, read the caption. Senate Bill 1950 relating to accepting an early voting ballot voted by mail. You're recognized to engrossment. Thank you, Mr. President. I move pass engrossment of Senate Bill 1950. Secretary will call the roll. Alvarado, Betancourt, Birdwell, Blanco, Campbell, Creighton. 19 ayes, 12 nays. The bill passed to engrossment. We'll hold there. Thank you, Mr. President, members.
Senator Swartner, you're recognized to uh, suspend the intent calendar and the regular order of business on committee substitute for JR1. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, members, I move to suspend the intent calendar and regular order of business to take up and consider the committee substitute to uh, SJR1. Members, this is the, uh, the constitutional amendment <clears throat> that proposes a um, well, this is the bill that proposes a constitutional amendment providing for the creation of the Texas Energy Insurance Fund and the authorization of funding mechanisms to support the construction and operation of electric generation facilities in Texas. It is uh, the SJR for Senate Bill 6 that was passed off the floor yesterday. Move suspension and of the intent calendar and regular order of business. Secretary will call the roll. Secretary will call the roll. Alvarado, Betancourt, Third World. 25 ayes, 6 nays. The intent calendar rules are suspended. Chair lays out on second reading committee substitute for SJR 1. Secretary, read the caption. Committee substitute SJR 1 proposing a constitutional amendment providing for the creation of the Texas Energy Insurance Fund. You're recognized passage to engrossment. Thank you, Mr. President. I move passage to engrossment. Can we substitute SGR 1? I'll give the secretary time to register the votes. Secretary will call the roll. Alvarado, Betancourt, Gordon, 24 Robinson. ayes and 7 nays. The bill passes to engrossment. You recognize to suspend the constitutional three-day rule. So move, Mr. President. Secretary will call the roll. Alvarado, Betancourt, Gregor, Blanco. 26 ayes, 5 nays. The rule is suspended. Chair now lays out in third uh, reading and final passage committee substitute for JR1. Secretary will read the caption. Committee substitute SJR1 proposing a constitutional amendment providing for the creation of the Texas Energy Insurance Fund. You recognize on final. Thank you, Mr. President. I move final passage committee substitute SJR1. Secretary will call the roll. Alvarado, Bencourt, Birdwell, Blanco. 24 ayes and 7 nays. Thank you again. Great work. Bipartisan. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, members.
Members, I was thinking up here that maybe one day next week or the week after we'll have a retro Senate day where everyone will have to actually vote from their desk like we used to forever, as opposed to all electronic voting here. It would give her at least a break for a day of uh, keeping track of all of your votes. So I think I'll give you fair warning one day next week. That's the way it was when I was a senator. It was hold up one, hold up two. Uh, you, can, you can wear your retro jerseys that day, your, you know, your throwback uh, jerseys. Uh, just kidding on that, still shirt and tie. That's right. Senator Perry, you're recognized the committee substitute for Senate Bill 2440. Spend a regular order of business. Thank you, members, Mr. President. Uh, Senate Bill 2440 addresses issues where buyers of a home may not have access to pro promised groundwater resources. The re bill requires those subdividing land for purchase where each house will rely on a personal well for water supply to verify the existence of available groundwater. It's currently in statute. It's making a may to a shall. With that, I've moved to suspend the regular order of business. Any objection? Hearing none. Rules suspended. Chair lays out second reading. Committee substitute for Senate Bill 2440. Secretary, read the caption. Committee substitute Senate Bill 2440 relating to requiring certain plots for the subdivision of land to include proof of groundwater supply. You're recognized on passage to engrossment. Move passage to engrossment. Any objection? Hearing none. <laughs> Bill passes to engrossment. You're recognized on suspension of the constitutional three day rule. Move suspend the constitutional three day rule. Any secretary will call the roll? Alvarado, Bettencourt, Burnwell. 31 well. ayes, no nays. The rule suspended. Chair lays out third reading and final passage. Committee substitute for Senate Bill 2440. Secretary, read the caption. Committee substitute Senate Bill 2440 relating to requiring certain plats for the subdivision of land to include proof of groundwater supply. You're recognized on final. Move final passage. Secretary will call the roll. Alvarado, Bettencourt, Burnwell, Blanco. 31 ayes, no nays. The bill is finally passed. Thank you. To the water man of the session. Thank you, there, Senator.
Senator Perry, you're back up. Committee substitute for Senate Bill 614, spend the regular order of business. Senate Bill 614, spend the regular order of business. Thank you, uh, Mr. President and members. Safety placements within the DF. PS is nothing new. They're typically or commonly referred to as shadow placements. Senate Bill 614 chooses to make those a little more transparent, a little bit more uh, parent friendly as far as notification goes, and they're a little bit more engagement by the parent to allow for uh, a tracking and reporting of those. With that, I move to suspend the regular order of business. Senate Bill 6, to me, substitute 614. Any objection? Hearing none, we'll spend it. Charlie's out in second reading. Committee substitute for Senate Bill 614. Secretary, read the caption. Committee substitute Senate Bill 614 relating to certain procedures relating to children placed under parental child safety placement. You recognize on passage to engrossment? Move passage to engrossment. Any objection? Hearing none. Bill passed to engrossment. You recognize spend the constitutional three-day rule. Move to spend the constitutional three-day rule. Secretary will call the roll. Alvarado, Bettencourt. 31 ayes, no nays. Rule spent. Chair lays out third reading and final passage. Committee substitute for Senate Bill 7614. Secretary will read the caption. Committee substitute Senate Bill 614 relating to certain procedures relating to children placed under a parental child safety placement. You recognize them final. Move final passage. Secretary Committee will call the roll. 614. Alvarado, Bettencourt, Birdwell. 31 ayes, no nays. The bill's finally passed. Thank you, Mr. President. President. Senator Bettencourt.
The chair recognizes Senator Menendez to introduce the doctor of the day. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Members, today we are fortunate and blessed to have not one, but two doctors of the day. And so I want to introduce both of them. And first, uh, please help me recognizing both Dr. Cristina Cepeda as one of our doctors. And Dr. Cepeda graduated from University of Texas RGV School of Medicine, then completed her residency at UT Health Science Center at San Antonio, my hometown. And uh, also in working with the UT Health Science Center, Dr. Cepeda has made great strides to ensure that families in our community can meet their full health potentials. Very important that we recognize the importance of doctors like Dr. Cepeda because without them we could not have the advancements in science or proper care that we need to stay healthy. And she has shown she's dedicated to helping everybody in her community. Alongside her, help me in welcoming Dr. Yoon Shi. Uh, Dr. Shi obtained her bachelor's in medicine at Beijing, China, then continued to San Antonio for her PhD in physiology. And shortly after graduating with her PhD, Dr. Shi decided to come work for the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio. And at UT Health Science Center San Antonio, Dr. Shi has helped many patients in our community and gives back everywhere she can through her volunteer work. She has been active in the community, remains active in the medical community by participating in medical societies such as the North American Primary Care Research Group and the American Association of Family Medicine. Members, please help me welcome both Dr. Cepeda and Dr. Shi and thank them for their service to Texas. Thank you and welcome to the Texas Senate. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, members.
Mr. Doorkeeper. Mr. President, there's a message from the House. Admit the messenger. Mr. President, I'm directed by the House to inform the Senate that the House has taken the following action. The House has passed the following measures. Right. Senator Zafferini, you recognize for a motion to spend the regular order of business on the committee substitute for Senate Bill 812. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President and members, I move to suspend the Senate's regular order of business in order to take up and consider at this time the committee substitute for Senate Bill 812 relating to food allergen awareness in food service establishments, food manager certifications, and food service programs. Members, this is a bill that would reduce the risk of persons experiencing costly allergic food reactions and prevent avoidable deaths by requiring appropriate signage and training programs at food service establishments and food manager certification programs to include food allergies as a subject. Mr. President, I move suspension. Senator Zafferini moves suspension of the regular order of business on the committee substitute for Senate Bill 812. There is objection. Secretary will call the roll. Alvarado, Bentcourt, Birdwell, Blanco, Campbell, Creighton, Eckhart, Flores, Gutierrez, Hall. There being 26 ayes and five nays, the rules are suspended. The chair lays out on second reading the committee substitute for Senate Bill 812. The secretary will read the caption. Committee substitute Senate Bill 812 relating to food allergen awareness in food service establishments, food handler and food manager certifications, and food service training or education programs. Senator Zafferini, recognized for a motion. Thank you, Mr. President. I move passage to engrossment. Senator Zafferini moves passage to engrossment. The secretary will call the roll. Alvarado, Betancourt, Birdwell, Blanco, Campbell, Creighton, Eckhart, Flores, Gutierrez. There being 26 ayes and five nays, the bill is passed to engrossment. Senator Zafferini is recognized for a motion to suspend the constitutional three-day rule. Thank you, Mr. President. So moved. Senator Zafferini moves the suspension of the three-day rule. The secretary will call the roll. Alvarado, Betancourt, Birdwell, Plon Blanco, Campbell, Creighton, Eckhart, Flores. There being 26 ayes and five nays, the rules are suspended. The chair lays out on third reading and final passage. The committee substitute to Senate Bill 812. The secretary will read the caption. Committee substitute Senate Bill 812 relating to food allergen awareness in food service establishments, food handler and food manager certifications, and food service training or education program. Senator Zafari, you're recognized for a motion. Thank you, Mr. President. I move final passage. Senator Zafferini moves final passage of the committee substitute to Senate Bill 812. The secretary will call the roll. Alvarado, Bencourt, Birdwell, Blanco, Campbell, Creighton, Eckhart, Flores. There being 26 ayes and five nays, the bill is finally passed. Congratulations, Dean, in waiting. <laughs> Thank and you, Mr. Waiting. President and members. And waiting. <laughs> and waiting. <laughs>
Senator Birdwell, are you ready? The chair lays out the following resolution. The secretary will read the resolution. Senate Resolution 394 by Birdwell, recognizing April 6, 2023 as Hood County Day at the State Capitol. The chair recognizes Senator Birdwell on the resolution. Thank you, Mr. President and members. It is Hood County Day at the State Capitol. So members, just know that the hood is in the building. It is <laughs> Hood County was created by the 11th Texas Legislature in 1866 and is the county seat is Granbury, my, uh, my home, which was founded in 1854. Hood County is home to the historic Hood County Courthouse, and Granbury has been recognized three times by USA Today as the best historic small town in Texas. The most popular crop in Hood County is, of course, hay, peanuts, and pecans, and Hood County's Lake Granbury is a wonderful place for recreation and fishing when they cooperate and features bass, catfish, and coffee. Everyone loves music, and Hood County is home to the Granbury Opera House and the new Granbury Live, which is located on the historic downtown square. I'd like to recognize some of the members from the Hood County Gallery, a delegation in the gallery today, and ask that they stand as I call their name. Our county judge, Judge Massengale, would you please stand, sir? <laughs> Mayor, who, uh, Mayor Pro Tem uh, Bur uh, Trish Burwell. There we go. City Council Member Bruce Wadley. City Council member and neighbor, Steve Vale. Members of the Granbury ISD board, uh, Barbara Townsend, our vice president. Courtney Gore, the secretary. Billy Wimberly, the trustee, one of the trustees. And then our Chamber of Commerce president, Brian Bondi. We also have a number of the uh, 22-23 class of uh, leadership, Granbury and junior leadership. Members, please welcome the entire Hood County delegation, and I ask that uh, all of them be, uh, stand and be recognized. Welcome to your state senate. Hua, I move adoption, Mr. President. Senator Burwell has moved adoption of the resolution, and how could we resist the hood being in the building? I assume they're headed to the house next, so there'll be the hood in the house. All right. Is there objection to the uh, to the resolution? Chair, here's none. The resolution's adopted. Thank you for coming, Hood County. Good to have you all with us today. Senator Birdwell. We'll let you pass an important bill in front of your Hood County, okay? Ooh, yes, sir. You're recognized to spend the regular order of business on SJR 59. Thank you, Mr. President and members. I move to suspend the Senate's regular order of business, take up and consider SJR 59. Members, the Texas legislature has a constitutional time stipulation of convening 140 days every odd year. Additionally, the first 60 days are limited to specific items with the first 30 days devoted to emergency appropriations, confirming gubernatorial appointees, and emergency items as submitted by the governor. The remaining 30 days, the various committees may hold hearings for pending business and the governor's emergency items. Members, during a 730-day biennium, the executive and judicial branches are at work with all of their constitutional authorities the entire 730 days. Members, it's really noisy in here. It's really hard to hear the senator, so if we can have some order, thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. The legislature currently may only work at its discretion and at its will for 80 days out of that 730. In our 140-day session, the first 60 days, we may only work on those nominations and emergency appropriations and, and the governor's emergency items, as I'd mentioned, as designated by the governor or by four-fifths of the members of the body wanting to bring something to the floor. Four-fifths is an incredibly high threshold, and in fact, it exists nowhere else in any other state element of of uh, the state constitution or in our federal constitution, there is no threshold set that high. 
Members SDR 59 would afford the legislature more time to exert its will and members to address concerns that many of you had after it came out of the State Affairs Committee unanimously, I will have an amendment that changes the 60-day preclusion from 60 to zero to now 60 to 30, where we would have 30 days similar to what we have now, but also place a two-thirds threshold on the members that if they wish to bring anything to the floor in the first 30 days. So members, I ask your favorable consideration. This would allow the legislature to exact its will for 110 days of the 140 days of the legislative session, rather than for only 80 days of the 140 day legislative session. With that, Mr. President, I move suspension. Senator Menendez, what purpose? Ask questions of the author. Do you yield? Yes, Mr. President, I yield. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Birdwell. Uh, Sir Birdwell, you, um, you, you served in our military forces in the Army, correct? Yes, sir. Is, you're familiar with that phrase. What's that phrase? Hurry up and then wait? Uh, yes, sir. Hurry up and wait. Yes, sir. Hurry up and wait. <laughs> Does it sometimes feel like to you like that's what we do around here? That is, that is true. Um, I won't use some of the more descriptive language you and I have had uh, about the session uh, 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 privately. But, right. But yes, look, there, there's merit to in, in making this adjustment. And look, the, the amendment's not before us yet. That amendment will come. Right. Um, but there's, there's merit to it uh, for the amendment and merit to going from instead of 60 to 0, 60 to 30. Uh, because of the ledge council, we've had some challenges with ledge council this go around and being prepared to hear bills. Um, but my biggest concern in bringing this is the legislature is the embodiment of the will of the people of the state of Texas. Correct. When Madison wrote in Federalist 51 that the legislative body must necessarily predominate, because of that predomination, the founding fathers at the federal level divided the legislature into two distinct bodies to dilute that supreme power of the legislative branch. Because while we are equal in our sovereignty across the jurisdiction called the state of Texas, we are not equal in our combat power. And I, I shouldn't say combat because that's just an old soldier talking to you, but, but the legislative branch, if two thirds of us wish to do something, there's very little the other two branches can do about it. And so the founding fathers wanting to dilute to a degree the legislative branch's power because it was supreme and must predominate, they diluted it to make it more difficult to dominate. The founders of Texas diluted that power even more by constraining the legislature into a shorter period of time that even though the legislature or the executive and judicial branch are at work all 730 days, the state legislature could only work 140. And out of that 140, we can actually only exert our will without either an expressed uh, grant of emergency from the governor or four-fifths of the body deciding to take something up. Therefore, that first 60 days, we tend to do resolutions, and those are important to do for our, our constituents back home, but it doesn't let us begin to attend to the business that we want to attend to without the, legis without the governor's permission or, or four-fifths of the body wanting to take it up. And there's only, in my eight years, in the le eight sessions in the legislature, there's only twice we've done, the, done a four-fifths. You just said that the, we don't get to attend to the business that we want to attend to. We are elected by, on average, I guess, our districts, we, re we tend to represent, they're supposed to have around 950,000 constituents, correct? That is correct. Nearly a million. Is Nearly there. a million people. Have you ever had constituents ask you, what's taking so long? Why are y'all not working on this? What, 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 what are you doing? Have you not had people ask you these that, questions? That, that happens a lot, and there's times that a lot of the questions I get are, where do you stand on House Bill such and such? Right. And I'm like, I haven't read House Bill such and such because I've got enough that I'm dealing with in the Senate. So right. that does happen. The purpose of this is not to compel us to hurry, right? but to give us the ability at our discretion to say, this is important enough, we're going to get to it without having to ask either what is Four-fifths is an incredibly high threat. That's 26 of the senators would have to say we want to take this up. 
Right. Or if the governor's got to say, take it up. And here's the, when doing my research on the bill, Governor Perry averaged about 31 days before he would give us emergency items, and Governor Abbott averages 33. So you're already halfway into the session, or halfway into that 30-day period, or 60-day period, as it is now, before the governor normally would give us a, uh, an emergency item. Yesterday, you bring up a good example. Yesterday, we debated some electric grid bills that are critically important to the resiliency and uh, the fact that we must make sure that when Texans flip their light switch on or their air conditioner or their heat, that they know the power will be there to power whatever their needs are. In some cases, their life and death needs, dial dialysis machines and other things. Issues like the electric grid and, and how we are a standalone grid in the nation and it's a competitive power market, issues like that are critically complicated, are they not? They are, yes, sir. When, when, when Senator Nichols, our engineer, says it's complicated, you know it's complicated. Yeah, absolutely. We've been working on it for years. And so your bill, I, I like the originally filed version. And the amendment doesn't seem to water it down too much. But your bill just says we can start working, taking testimony, deliberating sooner on things that, are, right. that we deem important, that we believe are necessary for us to represent our constituents. Because when we vet information, we can get a better work product. I believe so, absolutely. What the, uh, while the amendment's not before us, the amendment would, that, that I bring forward takes it from instead of 60 to zero, 60 to 30. It allows, it does not compel, but it allows committees to begin meeting. And then on the 31st day of the legislative session, if, it, if we want to bring something to the floor, then it can be brought to the floor by the normal committee process. Committees can hear bills and other things in those first 30 days. The governor can still give us an emergency item in the first 30 days if he wishes to do so. We can take that up, bring it to the floor, but it allows us to the discretion to work our will if it's something we think is important enough without the four-fifths or the chief executive giving us the word to go. Yes, no, very thorough explanation. Um, you've been in committees that have been meeting at 1, 2 in the morning after we've been in meetings for probably 12 hours, 15 hours, 16 hours. Is that when we do our best work? Um, I like to think we do great work. Um, but is it but, when we do, uh, is it optimal? But uh, it, it's a lot like ranger, ranger school. No food, no sleep, uh, and you're still expected to perform. Yeah. Uh, and so what, what was it, a couple weeks ago on, uh, on school choice, we were in the education till just after midnight. Mm -hmm. Last session we've had them. So we've had those sessions where things will go long. Yeah. That's part of the duties. We get paid, you salute, and you move out. But, well, uh, yes, and, and I'm not questioning anyone's commitment. What I'm saying that is if we get to work, start the work earlier, we don't have to pack the committee meetings with so much information. We can dedicate more time to individual subjects so that we don't have to have meetings. Well, uh, you know, we're elected to be here, but our constituents who want to come and testify on these bills have lives. And if they said that the committee meeting starts at 8 o'clock on, on Tuesday, but the bill's not, they're not called to testify till midnight on Wednesday, they, what about their kids and their job and all that? Your amendment will make it easier for the democratic process of people coming to have their voice heard to, to work. And that's why I'm 100% supportive, because this should be the building where the people's voice is put into power through their representatives, through us. And so that's why I appreciate your bill, so that we can get to work and not waste time. I'm fine with resolutions. I don't care. We can be here. But sometimes we'll, we'll gavel in and we'll be out in an hour and a half or two where we could be doing some more work. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Support, Thank you, Senator Mr. President. Mendez. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Menendez. I couldn't agree more. Uh, Senator Birdwell, did you mention you, ha you mentioned you have an amendment, right? Yes, sir. Coming up. But, uh, okay. Any... Objection on suspending the rules. Hearing none. Rules are suspended. Chair lays out on second reading. SJR 59. Secretary, read the caption. SJR 59, proposing a constitution amendment regarding the time during which the legislature may act on bills or resolutions during a regular session. 
You're recognized on your amendment. There is an amendment, members. The secretary will, I'm sorry, let her read the caption first. Secretary, read the caption. Floor amendment number one by Birdwell. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President and members. Uh, as I'd mentioned in the floor layout, as amended, SJR 59 would reduce the time from 60 days to 30 days instead of zero days. The first 30 days would still be devoted to the introduction of bills, yet allow committee hearings to consider bills and resolutions. Also during the first 30 days, the legislature would still be able to consider items that are related to gubernatorial appointees, emergency appropriations, and governor emergency items, which is our current constitutional operational tempo. As amended, after the first 30 days is concluded, the legislature may consider items then pending. And additionally, the amendment decreases the vote threshold from four-fifths to two-thirds of an affirmative vote of the body for each respective house to determine its order of business. Members, this amendment seeks to reduce the current constitutional time constraint from 60 to 30 days. As, the body would, as, as a body, this would provide the legislature the opportunity to address legislation that is important to all of us in our district in a more timely and efficient manner, and I move adoption, Mr. President. Senator Hall, question on the amendment? Yes, question for the audience. Do you yield? I yield, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Birdwell, for bringing this forward. I know we had a lot of discussion on it, and I appreciate what uh, Senator Menendez had to say, and I've had a lot of calls on it. And one of the things that current concerns is what I believe Will Rogers once said, no man's life, liberty, or property is safe when a legislature's in session. And uh, what we're doing is extending that time when we are truly in session because you can't really consider the first day, first 60 days as in session and since we don't really accomplish a whole lot. And so the idea of moving it uh, like you've done, I think, uh, is appealing for those that are looking at using the legislative session to effectively address good legislation that serves the people. And I hope that in doing this, as we move forward, we'll look at structuring what we do and the way we form committee hearings and so on so we can be more deliberate in maybe not having as many in one particular hearing. We'd be able to spread them out so that we can spend more time with letting the public in to um, provide us with their input because I, I think all of us would agree we have valuable input comes from what we have in public testimony. And sometimes it gets really tight in limiting them to two minutes. Uh, and uh, so I see this as an opportunity for the public to be able to participate in, in the process and us to be more deliberate in looking at fewer bills at one time in a committee so that we can uh, do a better job of really scrutinizing them and making them better uh, for those that are possible to make better. Uh, but uh, I think this moves us in the right direction so long as we take advantage of what it offers us. And that is more time to do, not look at it as an opportunity to be able to pass more bills, right. but look at it as an opportunity to make sure that the bills that we pass are better bills, more work on them, maybe even end up with fewer amendments on the floor because we took the time in the committee to dig into them and let the public participate in it. So I see this as a possibly a, an experiment for next session. And then maybe after that, we'll take a look and see what it did. And there's still another 30 days in there that we might want to look at if we see that what we're doing really works. And of course, we can always come back and change it if it doesn't work. But uh, just doing it because that's the way it's always been done before. We live in a different world today than when those rules were first written. It's a, it's a different pace, it's a different set of tools, uh, all the way around. And so I think it is very reasonable that we take a look at rules that were put in place a long time ago for an entirely different, that don't even exist for today. Not many people come to Austin on horseback. That's correct. Or in a wagon anymore. <laughs> and so it's, it's, an, it's a different world here. And so I think it's very reasonable that we do this, recognizing it's gonna be an experiment well, let's see what we can do to make the best of it. And thank so you, thank Senator. you for bringing this forward. Thank you. I appreciate it. I could respond in so many ways, but I, I won't belabor it. I'll just simply say I concur. And thank you for your strong support. Thank you, Senator. Thanks. Senator Betancourt, what purpose? Ask a question of the author. On the amendment. On the amendment. Yes, sir. I yield, Mr. President. Uh, I just wanted to say, Senator Birdwell, because I think everyone on the floor knows that uh, effectively you're our constitutional scholar. And I see, however, we have quite a, a, you know, a gallery today. 
and it looks like a school just showed up, which I think it was a preparatory school, right, Scott? Do, am I guessing correctly? And right, he's the he's the chaplain up there, and they're going to get to witness something that we don't do very often, which is uh, you know propose amending the Constitution. True. Um, amending the Constitution is in deliberately hard, um, and appropriately so. And that's why I've worked this bill and worked the amendment the way I have uh, to reach that, uh, uh, that agreement among the bulk of the body um, because there, there is a great degree of frustration um, at the, the volume of things we try to do in a very compressed time. Uh, I would rather we do quality work rather than compressed work, you know, because at the end of session, it, and this would afford the House the same ability. Uh, that's why it's a constitutional amendment, because it would afford the House the opportunity to, uh, depending on what they do with the bill, how they may organize. Uh, they've got to choose a speaker. We don't have to do that. Our, our president is uh, determined by the, the will of the, the voters of the entire state. But I appreciate your kindness. Uh, well, that's true. I, I imagine you, like George uh, Mason, uh, you know, Madison, you name it, uh, back, uh, uh, you know, back in the late uh, 1790s and 80s, talking about the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and and all the interplay. And I just, yeah. while we had a, a a group here, I wanted to make sure that the, the 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 school group realizes that we don't propose amending the Texas Constitution every day, um, and it certainly doesn't happen on a federal level. But it's quite actually a treat for them to see the constitutional scholar of the Senate propose another very good amendment uh, to the uh, uh, to the Texas Constitution and uh, it will offer their parents a chance to vote on it in November if passed right. by the House. That's correct. So good, thanks for the good work as always, Senator Birdwell. Ooh, uh, thank you, Senator Betancourt. Thank you for your work this session, all the, uh, the election-related items that you've been working on. Thank you, sir. Any objection to the amendment? Hearing none, the amendment is adopted. You're recognized passage to engrossment. Move passage to engrossment, Mr. President. A any objection? Hearing none, bill passes to engrossment. You're now recognized by the constitutional three-day rule. So move, Mr. President. Secretary will call the roll when ready. Alvarado, Bencourt, Berger, Blanco, Kim. 28 ayes and three nays. The rule is suspended. Charlie's out third reading final passage. SJR 59, Secretary, read the caption. SJR 59, proposing a constitutional amendment regarding the time during which the legislature may act on bills or resolutions. You're recognized on final passage. Move final passage, Mr. President. Secretary, call the roll. Alvarado, Betancourt, Birdwell, Blanco, Campbell. 28 ayes, 3 nays. The SJR 59 is passed. I think it's a very important constitutional amendment. Thank you. It would give more power back to the legislature in both chambers. I hope the House will also pass this. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President and members. Members, we're, we have one more bill, and then we're going to take a break for an hour. Uh, so that state affairs can meet, higher ed's going to meet, and then when we come back, we will pick up Senate Bill 8 and 9. The reason why we're behind is we've had quite a few amendments turned in today, uh, as well as yesterday on both bills, a lot of amendments, and so they have to be filed. We've got to get it all organized, so that's the reason we're, we're a little behind today, but it's the amendments that we have coming in, and we'll uh, address those. So we'll to hear this bill, and then we'll break for an hour, and then we'll come back. So Senator Mays, you're recognized on committee substitute. I'm sorry, Middleton. Mays Middleton, sorry. Uh, committee substitute for Senate Bill 175 to spend the regular order of business. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, um, I move suspension of the Senate's regular order of business to take up and consider committee substitute for Senate Bill 175. Senate Bill 175 will ban the practice of taxpayer-funded lobbying in Texas. And what taxpayer-funded lobbying is, is the use of public funds by political subdivisions of the state for registered Austin lobbyists. And this practice occurs in two ways. 
either one, directly hiring someone required to register as a lobbyist under Chapter 305 of the Government Code, or two, the payment of public funds to a statewide nonprofit association that primarily represents political subdivisions of the state and contracts with a person required to register as a lobbyist under Chapter 305. And this bill only prohibits those two models of taxpayer-funded lobbying. It is fundamentally wrong that $75 million a year of local tax money, your local tax money, is spent annually on Austin lobbyists that act as a middleman between local and state elected officials. Taxpayers don't need a middleman. Elected officials are supposed to directly represent their communities, whether at the state level or the local level, and better than an Austin lobbyist, every taxpayer has a state representative and a state senator to represent them in Austin. And what this bill does, Senate Bill 175, it encourages that direct communication between elected officials by removing the Austin lobbyist middleman. And after all, why are hired gun lobbyists getting special treatment to use taxpayer funds to have an advantage over the voices of local voters at their state capital. Frequently, taxpayer-funded lobbyists are hired to work against legislation that is clearly in the best interest of taxpayers and parents. For example, they lobbied against the ban on a state income tax, which passed with over 75% of the statewide vote. They lobbied against fixing the teacher retirement pension system, which was Senate Bill 12 in 2019. Uh, they lobby against trusting and empowering parents. They have lobbied against property tax relief and reform, and they even want a higher motor vehicle gas tax, which we know what that'll do to everyone with the inflation that we're experiencing right now. And actually, it was taxpayer-funded lobbyists that asked that parents be investigated as domestic terrorists under the Patriot Act. That is unacceptable. And this bill, it does not affect Chambers of Commerce. It does not affect parent-teacher associations, fire associations, police associations, sheriff's associations. Those are individuals that are paying dues. And those individuals have a choice to join those associations. But taxpayers, they have no choice but to pay for the lobbyists they are likely to disagree with. It is for speech by Texas taxpayers. And this bill does not ban or prohibit associations like the Texas Association of Counties, Texas Municipal League, from doing the things that we heard about in committee extensively that are of great value to local government, which is things like legal services, risk pool insurance, continuing education, legislative tracking, bill reading, bill analysis, bill recommendations, newsletters, sending updates. And I will have an amendment as well that Senator Flores is going to offer that I will lay out here in a minute when he offers it that will clarify that. Because at the end of the day, you don't have to register under Chapter 305 to provide those important services. And this bill does not prohibit local elected officials or their staff from communicating with members of the legislature or using public funds to travel to Austin to testify before the legislature. There is an absolute exemption from registration already in the government code for that. And at the end of the day, all levels of government, every level, us, local, are elected to directly represent our constituents' voices in Austin without an Austin lobbyist middleman. With that, I move suspension of the regular order business to take up and consider committee substitute of Senate Bill 175. Senator West, what purpose? Question of the author. Do you yield? I do. Senator Middleton, um, as it relates to your bill, I've opposed it in the past, I'm going to oppose it again today. But let me ask you this question. Does the state of Texas pay lobbyists to lobby for it in Washington? And if they do, if it does, you would want to ban that also, correct? That is a great question, and I'm very glad you brought that up so I can clarify that. We do not have registered lobbyists in Washington, D.C. They are employees of the Office of State and Federal Relations, which is allowed just as this bill allows employees of no, local I, government. No, I understand like, that. I understand that. I'm saying, so we don't employ independent lobbyists on behalf of the state of Texas? This bill only addresses registered lobbyists. And so Office of State and Federal Relations 
Those are employees of the governor's office, I'm, much I'm as not county judges' them. employees. I'm not Austin. talking about them, sir. I'm asking you, does that office employ independent lobbyists that they utilize on a case-by-case -case basis? Are you, are you telling us that the only quote-unquote external affairs persons that are used by the state of Texas in Washington, D.C. are employees of the governor's office? Is that, they're is that what you're saying? They're not registered lobbyists. That's, they're not registered lobbyists. Are, are you sure about that? We don't I, employ I, any registered lobbyists in the state of Texas. Political in, in subdivisions Washington. do. No, I'm not talking about political subdivisions. I'm talking about Washington right now. Office of State uh, Federal Relations, they're not registered lobbyists. They're not. Well, again, you, well, maybe I'm not answering the question correctly. Let me, let me slow down. Does the Office of Federal Lobbyists that it's employed by the governor's office hire outside lobbyists to work on behalf of the state of Texas? That's the question. OSFR does not have registered lobbyists, no. I'm sorry? OSFR does not have registered lobbyists. When you say they don't have registered lobbyists, you're saying they do not hire registered lobbyists? Right, and this bill only applies to the state level, you know, okay. as well. Again, right? again, I know what the bill applies to, all right? But when you say they don't have registered lobbyists, are you saying that they do not hire outside lobbyists? That's right, contract question. lobbyists, correct. And you're sure about that? I'm sure about that. Okay. Senator Menendez, what purpose? Thank you, Mr. President. Just uh, ask questions of the author. Do you yield? I do. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Milton. Um, so, I was also under the impression that even though we do have an office of state and federal relations in Washington that we hired outside lobbyists as the state of Texas, maybe we don't do that anymore. Um, let's, let's move on from there. Uh, does this bill impact any hospitals or teaching facilities that, that hire outside lobbyists? Does it prevent them from doing that? So this bill applies to all political subdivisions of the state, but of course there's gonna be an amendment that Senator Flores is gonna lay out to clarify what those associations can and cannot do that I think may be, may be helpful to your question here. How many, on average, how many bills are filed every legislative session? Thousands. Thousands, six, seven, the record, eight thousand? record this year, it's my record? understanding. Yeah, it's my understanding. So my understanding, I guess it's anywhere from five to 8,000, something like that. So that's a lot of, lot of bills, a lot of legislation, wouldn't you say? It's a lot, it's a lot. So under your bill, can a city or county pay an employee to come and lobby or advocate on behalf of its taxpayers? Yes, yeah, so under this bill, I think we may disagree on the, the the exact definition of lobbying here, so I don't want to confuse that. But under Chapter 305-003A, there is an exemption for full-time employees and employees of local government. They don't have to register to lobby if they're paid to come up here and advocate for their city, for their county, for their hospital district, any other political subdivision. Okay. So if I understand the purpose of your bill, if a city or county chooses to hire an employee, as we discussed, to share their respective issues or concerns on legislation, um, in order for us to best understand the needs of our cities and counties, I, I, I wonder, your, you, what you don't want them to do, they can have an, an employee not hire an outside lobbyist. What would keep them from bringing people who currently represent them outside in-house? If it's a full-time employee, that's up to them. Uh, this bill prohibits hired gun contract lobbyists that are on Congress Avenue, not part of, I don't think anyone's district, but uh, Senator Eckert here. So, but isn't it more cost-effective for our cities, counties, school districts, hospital districts, those people who are dealing with a the, sometimes the unfunded mandates that get passed up here. And sometimes when, we, when we're passing a good idea, it may, and we, we're, we're just pushing the cost down. I'll give you an example. 
you're familiar with the fact that during COVID, we had a lot of prisoners that were already ready to be picked up and transferred to a state prison, but we left them inside the county jails at their expense. And wouldn't it, aren't we precluding them from being able to tell us, hey, you need to pass a bill, like I think Senator Bob Hall has, to help pay for what you've done to us. Sometimes we don't act, our agencies at the state don't act in the best interest of our local governments. And so isn't that a reason for them to be able to have outside professionals to help them? Well, so this bill only applies for this what we're talking about here with cities and counties, so right. directly representing them, and then you're talking about contract lobbyists, to influencing the outcome of legislation. So when you're dealing with state agencies, that's not influencing the outcome of legislation. That only occurs every other year, January through June usually. But Senator Hall has filed a great bill it's for us, the state, if we don't pick up our prisoners, and they're lobbying us, they send us information, hey, support that bill. So it's not like they're always fighting a bill. They're saying this bill will help level the playing field. The state needs to pick up its, its employee, its prisoners, or pay us if they haven't. And so sometimes these contract lobbyists on behalf of the cities and the counties, the people who are duly elected, uh, making the decisions on who they hire, they're trying to advocate so that we at the state don't unnecessarily create more uh, burden and sometimes cost. So that's the rationale for having outside lobbyists. And I'm not sure why, because I mean, in your presentation, your layout, it's almost as if they're always working against the best interests of the constituents. And I don't see it that way. Well, they absolutely can work against the best interests of constituents. We got a good example of that. So I'll point this out. So, you know, we see a lot of people in this building. We there are a lot of interested parties. There are a lot of sides on everything. And, you know, we do see a lot of what I would call, I guess, government relations are not lobbyists. So they work for cities, counties, school districts, hospital districts, other political subdivisions of the state. And they work for that entity directly. They have a fiduciary duty to that entity. It's in the budget. Their emails are open recordsable. Their phone records. Uh, all of that information is disclosable because it's subject to our public information laws. And they have that duty to that entity that they are employed by. And I have not seen one ever double deal who they work for as an employee of a city, a school district, a county. I have seen that happen with contract hired gun lobbyists. A good example is 2019. Um, we had the cable franchise cut bill. I don't know if you remember that, but we eliminated a cable franchise tax. And around May, when it's too late, you know, May... Things already decided around here by May. Um, it was discovered that the city of Houston had hired one of those contract lobbyists to oppose that bill. Well, it turned out that that same lobbying firm was hired to pass that bill, and it did end up passing. It was found out they were fired, of course, by the city of Houston, but wasn't a lot of skin off their back. I've never seen that happen like that for an employee of a city or county or a school district because they have that fiduciary duty. So this bill will make sure that their voices matter a lot more and they're not having to compete against those hired gun lobbyists who may not be in the best interest of that city, county, or school district or the taxpayers or voters. Does your bill apply to colleges and universities? It does not apply to universities, but it does apply to political subdivisions of the state, which includes junior colleges. And there is an amendment that I talked about that Senator Flores is offering that I think will help with where you're going here on that. Yeah, yeah no, I, I understand the motive for where you're going. I think that, unfortunately, like a lot of the things we do around here, I think with good intentions where we, we overcorrect and I... And I think that the, the extreme cases of where you're, which, like you described with Houston, are just that, extreme cases. I believe that what you we're doing is by taking this ability from our cities, counties, and other political subdivisions, we're preventing them from having sometimes hire experts in certain fields. Because sometimes a contract lobbyist might be an expert in, in let's say, if the bill has to do with property taxes or if a bill has to do with electricity, whatever the issue may be, that contract lobbyist, or maybe they're a former, like in the sense for Texas Tech, they hire Kent Hans, he's a contract lobbyist. But fortunately, he won't be affected because this doesn't affect universities. But we're keeping cities, counties, 
and schools from impacting, from hiring the people they believe will best serve the interests. And so, in essence, we're muffling the voices of the duly elected mayors, city council members, school board trustees, because we think we know best. So this is why, I, while I appreciate you taking my questions, I still think your bill is flawed. I will be voting against it. Well, of course, I disagree with that assertion that we're muffling anyone's voices. The way I see it is we're increasing the voices of who elected all of us. We're all elected by the same voters. It's all the same taxpayers that are voting at the ballot box. And we're elected to represent them directly. And I've, I haven't ever seen a bill in this chamber or the House that says, gosh, there's you know 1,200 ISDs and about that many cities and 254 counties. That's tough to keep up with. The state should hire lobbyists to go keep up with the commissioner's court or city council or ISD, you know, trustee meetings. They don't, we don't do that because we know, we all know our job is to represent our district directly. And so that's just carrying that out into this bill. Senator Eckhart, what purpose? To ask questions of the author, Mr. Do you yield? I do. Thank you so much, Senator Middleton. You are so right. We are all elected by the same voters, aren't we? We are. Um, I was a county judge at one point, elected by um, mostly the same voters as I am currently elected by. Actually, I had a larger constituency as a county judge. Um, are, are you aware that some county judges actually represent far more individuals than we senators do? Not very many of the 254 counties, but some of them, yes. You know. So every county is so different, isn't that every true? Every county is very different, that's yeah, right. The, the joke is if you've seen one county in Texas, you've seen one county in Texas. Um, I want to go back to Senator West's line of questioning for a moment. You said that the state does not hire any federal lobbyists. Through OSFR, they're not registered lobbyists, correct? And yet the OSFR website says state lobbying disclosure. Agencies or political subdivisions of the state by law must report to the office on any contract or subcontract between the agency or subdivision and a federal level government relations consultant. So some agencies of the state do hire federal level government relations consultants, don't they? No, the word lobbying in there is the same term that Senator Menendez used, which is not chapter 305, it's not registered lobby. So you have to go to the Federal Election Commission and look up and see if they're, they're registered and they're not. It was Senator Perry, I, sorry, Governor Perry, that fired the state's registered lobbyist about 15 years ago. At one point, the state did have them. They, we do not anymore. It's my understanding that some state agencies do contract with federal lobbyists, including TxDOT. Are you aware of that? There are grant making. There are grant making requests that TxDOT makes, but the Office of State and Federal Relations that Senator West pointed out does not have registered lobbyists. So you know, this, this bill does not impact the way they operate right now. And in fact, it encourages what I talked about earlier, which is you know, those employees of local government, just like the employees of state government, go into Austin, go into Washington, D.C. to make their voice heard directly on behalf of you know, the state or political subdivisions of the state. So this bill will not prevent TxDOT from continuing in their contractual relationship with their federal lobbyists, will it? No, no, this is only a state level. So um, these local governments and local governmental entities, they're our partners, are they not? Yes. Um, whether or not they join an association, they're still our partners, yes? Yes, they're all the political subdivisions of the state, you know, and we're all working together all the time to make this a better place to live and work. And it's important to know their thoughts on proposed legislation affecting them, yes? Right. How do you uh, get your information from your local uh, governmental entities? The best way is directly. So I think everybody in this chamber probably has the cell phone of nearly every local elected official in their district, and that's the best way to do that. Do you reach out to get information from local elected officials in other parts of the state? I hear from them. So I've had a number of meetings this session actually from with county judges and commissioners in districts a long way away from where I live in my district. And it's been it's always rewarding to do that because you hear different perspectives. But I hope that's a common practice. I don't know. But um, every session I am meeting with um, a local elected officials that are not in the district. Uh, that have concerns or support of particular legislation. So I think that's an important part of this process. 
Do you think it's possible to reach out to all 254 uh, county commissioners' courts across the state to find out how a bill will impact uh, you know, your county versus how it might impact Llano County? That's why under this bill, we make sure that those associations that I think that's what you're talking about are still allowed, and it's in the law right now, but we make it explicit that they can do bill tracking, so for and against, legislative alerts, mobilize support. You know, a lot of the groups that we see in Austin, what they'll do, um, like the doctors or the nurses, uh, they'll put out a position, but then they'll get the individuals that are members to come and testify for or against or speak to members. Works the same way for associations, and this bill per allows that and encourages that. But the entities who are members cannot contribute taxpayer dollars to them under your bill. They can as long as they don't have hired gun lobbyists. So there's an amendment today that allows full-time employees to have that exemption of, of the associations. So are you saying that if the Conference of Urban Counties has a full-time employee who comes and tells us the effect of bills that we're considering, uh, you would not consider that uh, um, against your legislation here? Well, we'll have to speak on the floor amendment number one, I think, when we get to it. Okay. So we've got to stick to the That'll four corners of the bill for now. Um, so I, I just want to, your county has a couple of municipalities over 100,000 and a couple of ISDs over 100,000. It's on the coast. Uh, it has significant flood issues and it has significant um, uh, health care uh, and is adjacent to a major health care hub. Um, but how would you, without the benefit of these um, these uh, advocacy organizations, how would you know how a bill might affect Senator Perry's district, for instance, not on the coast, doesn't have flood issues, has serious groundwater issues, um, has issues very different from yours, and probably very different special purpose uh, districts than yours? Well, first, I'm glad you brought up Galveston County because they have voted to support this bill. They wholeheartedly support this bill because they agree with me that they want to directly represent their constituents. And also importantly, the bill does preserve the ability of these associations like Texas Association of Counties, Texas Municipal League, there are a number of them from, it, it allows them and preserves their ability to do the bill tracking legislative analysis, tell members, hey, these are the bills that could impact your county, could impact your city, could impact your school district. Um, these are the ones we have concerns with, these are the ones we're for, these are the ones we're against. So they condense that and that is still allowed under this bill because there is an exemption for that. Um, so that's very important to point out and that's one of the main reasons why they support it is it continues to allow these associations to do that. But I, you know, you pointed out local uh, Gulf Coast issues. So I have to mention this, uh, Texas windstorm insurance, you know, that's 14 tier one coastal counties, right? That's really not that local of an issue. That impacts a lot of people from Beaumont to Brownsville. Well, here's the problem with that. Every session we have bills to control the rates of windstorm insurance, which it's not just homeowners, it's businesses, counties, cities, school districts, they all have to pay that windstorm insurance, right? We're all paying it. We all have to have that coverage because we're in a tier one area. And unfortunately, those associations never show up to support those bills. So I'm not really sure how they're representing local interests when they refuse to support things like that. And at the end of the day, I have to point this out too. Uh, sometimes the associations, they sell risk pool insurance. And sometimes what they're doing is representing who pays the most in risk pool insurance. You are not obligated to agree with the positions that these associations bring to you, are you? No one's obligated to agree with anyone on anything. We always reserve the right to disagree, Senator. So uh, what's the problem with some association bringing a position that you disagree with? No problem at all. Still allowed under this bill. But these associations will not be able to employ or contract with someone who must register as a lobbyist. Only contract. They can hire someone full time that can advocate for or against, but they cannot contract, but that's a different. And this bill would event. apply to uh, associations of emergency service districts, hospital districts, flood control districts, um, and as, any other as, local governmental entity? As long as it's a political subdivision of the state, but I've got to point this out here, where the associations that represent individuals, 
I think do a much better job doing so, and they are exempt from this bill because they represent individuals. So our police, our fire, our sheriff, our teachers, they hear from their membership. They represent their membership. And one of the problems, like with Texas Association of School Boards, they don't represent the individual trustees. They represent it as a government body, as a government institution. And but that creates a problem. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. That creates a problem. Who are they representing? Didn't those board trustees vote on their board whether or not to include their contribution toward the association in their budget? Are you talking about the dues? Mm-hmm. The dues don't pay for much lobbying. It's the $150 million in risk pool insurance that they're buying right now through TASB that that's paying for the lobbying. And guess how many employees the risk pool has? None. So they're cycling that money out to pay for lobbying efforts, which I think is very untransparent and it's not right to hide that from the taxpayers. So it sounds like your big beef is with risk pool insurance providers and not necessarily with associations of local governmental entities lobbying uh, for or against legislation at the state of Texas. No, I'm giving you these as examples as to how they're not representing local governments the way that they're claiming they are. Yeah. Thank you for answering my questions. Senator Betancourt, what purpose? Ask a question of the author. Yield. I yield. Uh, Senator Middleton, this fight's been going on a long time, hasn't it? It sure has. <laughs> uh, in 2005, I believe, uh, Senator Betancourt held a press conference here in this building when he was Harris County tax assessor with uh, Ron Wright and uh, Cheryl Johnson, my Galveston County tax assessor, on this very subject with Peggy Venable. And, well, it wasn't quite 2005, 2007. Okay, I'm sorry. Let talking. me just yeah. read for, uh, for the record here. January 16, 2007, at a press conference called last Thursday at the Texas Capitol by Peggy Venerable, director of the, uh, uh, of the Americans for Prosperity, Cheryl Johnson, tax assessor collector, uh, uh, you know, delivered a statement on behalf of herself and Harris County tax assessor collector Paul Betancourt, um, in the House Speaker's Conference Room. I mean, so think about it. This is, uh, let's see, do my math here quickly in my head. 16 years, two months, and 20 days, okay? So, Senator Milton, uh, why did you not attend this press conference? Where, where were you? <laughs> I was a student at UT. You were a student at UT? Totally unaware of what was happening. The great things that were happening with um, Senator Betancourt and... Uh, Cheryl getting Johnson. this, and right. Cheryl Johnson, you know. Now, and, uh, you know, uh, you, you should have just come over and, and you know, started your career earlier. Okay. <laughs> now, and on a serious note, uh, I appreciate you picking up this bill. We have passed versions of this bill for the last several sessions, but it is nice seeing the next generation picking up the torch on, on, a, on a, literally on an issue uh, that started with um, the people lobbying against tax or property tax relief. That's really the kernel of my involvement in this because I was nothing more furious to me than having people come by and saying that, you know, just because we're not raising the tax rate, we're not raising your bill, and that was pat patently wrong, but they were spending taxpayer dollars doing it, true? That's exactly right. I mean, we saw it firsthand, especially in the 2019 session, where you had people come to committee and say, I can't afford to pay my property taxes anymore, I'm being taxed out of my home, please help me. And then a lobbyist sitting next to them that's paid to be there with their own tax dollars to lobby against them and say, no, no, we can't pass these voter approved limits on property tax increases. No. They were lobbying its voter approval. And uh, so, uh, so this uh, debate has been going on, you know, really for well past 16 years now. And more importantly, the concept is, but it's really simple. Don't use the taxpayer's money to lobby against tax relief. All right, so right. congratulations on moving this bill forward. Uh, and uh, Uncle Paul is, is a happy, you know, uh, you know, joint author watching the next generation take the charge and take the hill. Thank you, Senator, for your leadership on this issue. Thank you. Senator Johnson, what purpose? Questions of the author? Do you yield? I do. Senator Middleton, are um, charter schools considered to be political subdivisions? 
No, they're not. So how are charter schools funded? With taxpayer dollars or private dollars? Charter schools are privately run. They are funded by tax dollars, the same as Head Start, uh, Pell Grants, you name it. We have programs where the state is funding uh, tuition to private religious-based universities as well. Okay. Would they be eligible to hire lobbyists if your bill passes? What this bill does... Uh, is it's it, a yes or no question. You're a lawyer. Come on. Wait, look, it only impacts political subdivisions of the state and where government money is going directly to a lobby. So that is the exact reason why it does not apply to police, fire, sheriff, teachers associations. Or so charter it, schools. My understanding is a lot of charter schools use foundation money to hire lobbyists, but... We're not restricting private entities in this bill. So charter schools could hire lobbyists and non-charter public schools could not hire lobbyists, correct? Non-charter public schools can still use their association and government relations employees to support or oppose bills, testify for or against bills in committee, have legislative analysis, bill alerts, all the things that are happening right now to really condense that down for trustees. Although, of course, we still get into the issue where the ISD, TASB lobbyists do not represent the individual school board members. I, I mean, I appreciate the edification, but it's still the answer to my question. It sounds like, yes, we're going to treat charter schools and non-charter public schools differently for purposes of being able to hire a lobbyist. And I, and I understand your concerns. We all have concerns with adequate representation. Another short question for you. Are lobbyists useless, all of them? I would not say that all lobbyists are useless. I think that's probably unfair. Um, you know, so I, I would not... And I would not agree with that. Why do corporations hire lobbyists? Their own choice. Well, it's why, did, own why choice. do they make that choice? I'm not going to read in why, but they make the choice on their own, and uh, it's up to them. It's their own money. Corporations don't get to levy a property tax on people by force, so it's a little different when tax money is going to a lobbyist, and if you don't like what they're lobbying on, quit paying your taxes, and someone's going to take your home. That's not the same. Right, but corporations, I, I guess, that since they're profit-driven, they make decisions that, that help their profits. So I guess they're figuring that by hiring a lobby, lobbyist, it's going to facilitate me being able to do what I need to do with respect to the state, right? I mean, it it's too speculative. A... I, I grant you, too speculative. I'll posit that and ask you, if my, a city make the same calculation, I'm trying to represent my, my municipal constituents, and I think the most effective way I can do that is to hire somebody who understands this extremely complex building, and they can't do it, but a corporation with whom that city might have to deal with, with, with whom that city might have to deal, can. Aren't you, aren't you tying their hands when they're trying to do their job with the most effective people possible? They're not, we're not tying their hands at all. I would say representing your constituents is the most effective thing to do possible. So having an employee of local government is very effective. And also they can still utilize associations to do that. So uh, bill tracking, legislative analysis, testifying for and against bills, uh, all the things that we heard in committee that are valuable, smaller cities typically, right? I mean, not, not the big cities like Dallas so much. They tend to have their own government relations departments and you know, a number are, of employees that handle cities, legislative tracking. Are, are, are the small cities the ones hiring lobbyists? Sometimes they do. Most don't. I, I will tell you this. I heard a story from a uh, state representative. I won't reveal the name, but for many years, his city had had a taxpayer-funded lobbyist. So in other words, someone they contracted with, a hired gun that we're addressing in this bill. They had never heard from them until they showed up to his office to oppose the ban on taxpayer-funded lobbying when their paycheck was at risk. So th that shows you they are not representing the best interests of local that, government. That's called inductive reasoning, where you take one individual example and extrapolate it to be the general rule. It sounds like they had a bad lobbyist. But listen, you, we, we've had a nice exchange. Uh, I, I think it's interesting that this point falls directly along partisan lines, and it's large cities that tend to be largely Democratic and smaller cities that tend to be larger than Republican. And the Democratic cities want to hire lobbyists, but the Republican small towns don't. And so the Republican voice, I, and, and I hate this partisan stuff, but how is this suddenly partisan? It, but it seems to have gotten that way, doesn't it? Well, it, it shouldn't be partisan, and it's not. Uh, 
the University of Houston Hobby School of Public Affairs, right, that former colleague Senator Watson ran, I think, at one point, right? Um, they did a poll, and I don't talk about polls a lot, but it showed that 69% of all Texans support the ban on taxpayer-funded lobbying, 64% of Democrats, 71% of Republicans, 71% of, Repu of independents as well. Some polls show up 91% support this. So I would say, do the voters support this? Yes. Do the politicians support this? Maybe not. Well, maybe it should be a, a, a constitutional amendment then. We'll put it to the voters as opposed to this body, because this body does stuff that, that contradict polls all the time. But it's, it's been a healthy exchange. I don't think you're right, but I appreciate the dialogue. Thank you. Senator Hall, what purpose? Ask some questions of the author. Do you yield? I yield. Thank you. Senator Milton, there's been some interesting discussion here on a very viewpoint, various viewpoints. Uh, one I'd like to point out, um, and I truly appreciate uh, Senator Menendez's recognition of my bill three, uh, 30, 318 on the 45 days that uh, holding prisoners, uh, the state's supposed to pick them up. I'm not sure where the thought came from that that was a lobby. The lo I was lobbied by our sheriffs who are having to pay for this. I got a phone call. And the sheriff said he was really concerned It was about it. I called some of the other sheriffs. They said, oh, absolutely. I've been thinking about calling you on that, but, you know, I'm glad you did. I think what I found is um, that the lobby actually, would you agree, that it interferes with our communicating with our local elected officials? That's right. Um, I'll give you an example here where Texas Municipal League, uh, I had a city manager tell me one time that they have a... Um, ethics code or some sort of uh, code that they um, asked them to support as city managers. And one of the things in there is they asked that they not come up and testify in Austin. In other words, leave it to us. We don't want to hear your voice. Let the real experts do it. Well, guess what? That voice may not always represent what the cities want. And that's wrong to tell them we don't want to hear from our city managers in Austin. Or to say that they may represent positions that people wouldn't agree with is probably an understatement. We got one of our major organizations from a national and at the local level, you may have remembered this, that referred to our parents that went to school board meetings as domestic terrorists. You recall that? I do, unfortunately. Yeah. TASB, organization that advises our school boards and a national organization. And we thought after the recoil from that, they might have learned their lesson, but they, they recently, they just put out a bill that uh, told schools that they need, needed to give all recognition to trans students at the sacrifice of straight students. They wrote that in there. Give them whatever they want, no matter what the impact is. They mocked parents this is a taxpayer-funded lobbying group that also wrote in a letter that when you take students on an overnight field trip where they spend the night, you should let the students pick who they're going to sleep with, and you don't have to tell the parents about it. I don't think that would represent the value of many people in this body. You, you recall those? That's right. You know, I, then that's why we're hearing from a lot of ISDs right now. Car Carol already did, but a lot of other ISDs are interested in leaving TASB because, first of all, of course, they don't represent the individual trustees. But second of all, they're obviously not representing the district's values or the parents' values in that. You know, and it's, it's unfortunate that parents or taxpayers, too, are having to subsidize something like that that is going against what parents want for their children. And it's not just the schools. We got our local governments. I believe uh, Texas Municipal League makes a lot of money off of taxpayer dollars. They opposed the property tax bill, did they not? They did. Uh, and after that bill passed, they put out a presentation 
that was called shaking the money tree. Well, the taxpayers are the money tree, and it was, you know, turning someone upside down, have the coins fall out of their pocket, a way to, to generate more fees to get around the property tax limits, which were not caps. They were voter-approved limits, right? So they were against having the voters have a say in tax increases. In other words, they didn't want to hear from the voters. They didn't want to hear from them. No, that's, that is absolute in-your-face uh, opposed to what we're trying to do here to protect property owners from excessive property taxes and other taxes. And, and I think you recognize what happens here. Anybody talks about a new revenue source, it doesn't go very far in the conversation. But you got an organization out there who's driving the local or other governments and ourselves. And not only that, but, but when we were trying to protect women and children, in, in uh, locker rooms, in the showers, the TML was in there opposing that legislation. And most recently, I think they've opposed this bill. That's taxpayer money being used to oppose this bill. So they just, the lobbyists interfere with our relationship. I think the biggest thing about it is the locals that would use say, well, I don't need to talk to them, the lobby's going to take care of that, interferes with them, our local elected officials, communicating directly with us. I, so. I agree 100%. Um, that's what we're supposed to do. That's how representative government with the Constitutional Republic is set up for that to happen. Um, and at the end of the day, what this will do, it'll grow not just the voice of the vo same voters that elect all of us, but the voice of our, our local elected officials, too, where... Congress Avenue lobbyists really are not doing a good job at all representing their vo voice in their state capital. That, that's right. And I'll just close, wrap it up with restating it. The finest lobbying going on is when one of our elected officials or more of them contact us like they did with the jail situation. And I think everybody in here agrees that that's a responsibility of the state and we should make sure that that happens. But that's the way things should be communicated. Elected official to elected official and citizens to, to their elected officials here, not some hired gun that also works for a commercial entity that will use their relationship with the local government and lobbying for something that's going to benefit them financially indirectly, but they use the local government that's paying for it, paying them to do it in order to come lobby us to, to have something happen that they're going to benefit on the other end financially. So I thank you very much for bringing this bill forward, sir. Thank you, Look Senator. forward to supporting it. Thank you. Uh, Senator West, for what purpose do you rise? Question of the author. Does the gentleman yield? I do. He yields. There was a discussion between you and Senator Johnson Concerning charter schools? Yes. It's my understanding that the charter schools was a part of the bill when it was originally filed and has now been taken out. Is that correct? That was not in the originally filed bill, no. Okay, but should charter schools be included in this? The bill does not impact private entities, and as you know, charter schools are uh, run by private. They, we're not exempting anyone. We're just applying only to political subdivisions of the state with hired gun All right, So if you have a situation where, like, charter schools, so it, it would apply to a public school district, though, right? It would. It All right, would so under the charter, higher... schools, charter schools get taxpayer dollars, correct? They do, but with public school districts, like we mentioned earlier, TASB's not representing I'm, I'm, individual well, I'm, trustees. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not talking about TASB right now, sir. Please, let me, let me ask a question, and I'll, I'll give you the respect of responding. But the whole genesis of this is, is that you don't want public funds to be used for lobbying, Correct. That's the whole genesis of it, right? You well, there's a, want there's a step in between here, so that's not totally correct because I do support the individual associations like I talked about earlier with our public sector employees like police and fire and teachers and sheriffs. Yes, they're public employees, and yes, they're paid with public funds, but they're making a choice on their own, and that represents that same choice. Right, let me go back to the question I just asked. Other than what you just said, you do not want public funds, taxpayer dollars, to be used for lobbying, correct? That's not the right way to describe it. So the individual choice matters in this. This is about public funds going directly to a contract lobbyist, not the same thing. That's the same. Well, okay, again, those are public dollars going to 
someone to come down here and lobby. So, except, so, except, ex hold up now, except for the exception that you just mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, in terms of organization paying for funds, paying for membership in organizations. You're okay with that. That's what I've heard you said over and over again. But absent that, having someone hire a lobbyist with public funds, you're against that. So, charter schools right, that are usually nonprofits. Wait, 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 hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Let's same as St. Jude that we just passed, it, hold by it, hold the way. Hold it, hold they have a lobbyist, too. Hold it, hold it. Okay, no. okay, but no. if you don't mind. They just got some money in that bill. If you, don't, no. <laughs> if you don't mind, let me go back to the same question. You are against, this bill basically says that you are against the use of public funds to hire lobbyists, save and accept the exceptions that you just talked about. Am I right or am I wrong? Only to the extent it applies to political subdivisions of the state. Okay, so if someone is getting public funds, they can hire a lobbyist to lobby. Is that what you're saying? Just like the St. Jude lobbyist I saw in the State Affairs Committee advocating for your bill that we just passed on this floor where we're putting more money into that, of course. So, yes, I mean, that's, they're going to receive public funds. So, charter schools are public schools, are they not? Charter schools are deemed public schools. That's okay, so, uh, so a public, quote-unquote, traditional public school would be prohibited under your bill, but a Charter public charter school would not be prohibited under you, under your bill because they're do you private. See, do you they, see they, some inconsistency they're, they're right privately there? run the same thing that's in our budget that I think we're pass here soon. The house is working on right now. There are a lot of private entities in that a lot in that budget that are receiving public funds. And what we're talking about in this bill is when local tax money, local public funds is those going, dollars are local tax dollars, Senator. But there's a step in between where someone gets a choice in that step in between. But they're still local tax dollars, though. They are local tax dollars. I don't see dollars, any inconsistency so. in your uh, rationale. I, I don't think it's inconsistent okay. at all. All right, all right that's so fine. So with this argument, we that's would fine. have to that, that's, abolish that's fine. sheriffs, fire, right, so police, let, let me ask, let me ask teachers. You this question. Let me ask you this question. You recall when I asked you the question about the use of public funds to lobby in Washington. Do you not recall that question? I, I do. All right, do you, do you recall your answer to that question? I do. What was the answer to the question? So here's more What on was that. the answer to the question? We do not have registered lobbyists with the Office of State and Federal Relations. But would you be uh, shocked to find out that that's not true? That's not true. So in, you, in DC, Would you be shocked to find out that based on the, for the Office of State and Federal Relations lobbying contracts in 2022, on the U.S. Senate website that there are several companies that were hired by the state of Texas using tax dollars, which is inconsistent with this particular bill, is it not? Well, so in Washington, D.C., I'll point out this. You have to register per chamber, so you correctly pointed that out. And right now, in each chamber's registration, the state, with Office of State and Federal Relations, does not have registered lobbyists, has not since Governor Perry. Well, hold on. This is 2023, and if it's something on the website in 2022, Perry was not governor then, correct? Correct, and I think what Who, you're who's talking governor, about... Who's governor in 2022? Governor Abbott, and I'll tell you There's this There's something also. on the website that says 2022. Senators, please don't talk over one another. Okay, so if, if it's something on the website that says 2022, that's under the current administration, is it not? Correct. All right, so that would run counter to the intent of your bill as it relates to local subdivisions and the use of public dollars to hire persons or entities to lobby, correct? No, and I'll tell you why. Uh, go to chapter 305, and what you're referring to also includes political subdivisions of the state, right? So I'm talking about the federal government right I, now in I, Texas. I, I am too, I am too, and I'm right, talking, I am too. I'm talking about political subdivisions of the state, so under, Chapter 305, there is an exemption in applying for grants. So applying for grants from an executive agency is exempted from Chapter 305, and I'll get the section of code for you here. Um, I can give it to you, but anyway, it's the same thing, same thing. It's identical situation.
Would you object, given that the genesis of this bill, the whole purpose of the bill, is not to use public dollars to lobby, save and accept those memberships and organizations? Would you accept an amendment to your bill that no state agency or state institution of higher education that receives state funds may use the funds to pay for a lobbyist person or company to engage in lobbying activities as defined in 2 U.S. 1602? So that is federal lobbying, and we had last session, and I supported this, there was a separate bill that prohibited political subdivisions of the state and the state from hiring registered lobbyists in Washington, D.C. That created a two-subject rule that can't be done, can't be done in this bill. So I cannot accept that amendment. It will kill the bill. Who, who said it, 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 uh, it's a... We worked with the House parliamentarian last okay. session Have on this. Have you worked with the Senate parliamentarian on represent, that? Well, it has to go on two sides here. You know, you can't just pass a bill in the Senate and not in the House, so... Well, then why don't we kind of reframe your bill to make certain it's not a two-subject issue? If, I mean, if this is so important, we have, we have time in the Senate to refile a bill and make certain that there are no constitutional infirmities. Well, I will, what we will do, and I will support this, is if you'll beg my pardon here, uh, suspend the rules to file a bill that matches what was filed in the House last time. If, if we can get the votes and that's all up to the members, that's not solely our decision here, but you know, why don't we work on that? So, so you are for making certain that no taxpayer dollars be used by the state of Texas to hire lobbyists in Washington, D.C.? And last session, I co-authored that bill in the House. I thought it was a good bill. Um, just satisfies the intent of, of what the author did, Representative Jaton. Thank you, Senator. Senator Perry, for what purpose do you rise? Question for the author. Will the gentleman yield? I yield. He so, yields. I think the amendment that Flores will put up will give TAC and TML for the small communities that they currently depend on for resource. Question I have for you is some of these smaller communities have big projects that extend beyond one community and they don't have the expertise. I can give you a good example, I-27 corridor has Laredo, Big Springs, Midland, Odessa, Lubbock, San Angelo, all the way up to Amarillo over to extending into Colorado. Very, very complicated inner workings with both federal and state. But on that project, and where I'm going here is a lot of times these lobbyists that we hire are not for coming into this legislative process and advocating for or against something, but they may be an integral piece of education community support organizing meetings, uh, and actually working on behalf of those communities for a bigger project than a single community could even do. But that expertise, so I want to be clear, it's either a yes or no that under your bill would a lobbying contract to help coordinate that communication, making sure the I's are dotted, the T's are crossed, when they get into the process of a designation of a state highway that will ultimately need to be designated as a federal highway. And then something as simple as some of my communities have applied for a uh, grant for a park and it was a lobbying firm that actually put that piece together and did it. So those two cases, there are bigger projects than one region, a lot of expertise involved, both federal and state. Are your, is your bill going to prohibit that contract from occurring with those lobbyists? So we don't impact the federal, obviously, which we I, just I discussed. Take federal off. And I started not to even say federal because I knew you were going to go there. I need a yes or no. Can right. Lubbock, Laredo, Amarillo, Big Springs, Odessa, Midland, San Angelo, Laredo, uh, up and down, Uvalde, all those corridor people hire a contract to work on a project of that magnitude. They can hire someone as a shared employee, which is already exempt right that now. That doesn't answer. And yes, so they the can. answer is no. They, they can. They can. Not a shared employee. I don't think there's any attorney firm in this state that would have a hired lobbyist contractor wanting to be hired from Lubbock, Midland, Odessa. I mean, who, who wants to be an employee of a local government to work on a project that when they have other billable hours at $1,000 an hour that they're probably giving up different rates. So if it's, if it's so the answer to your question is no, that would not be allowed. Well, but the highway may not, that may not be a bill because there is an exemption. This is only the influencing the outcome of legislation. So when you're dealing with TxDOT or Water Development Board or the Flood Infrastructure Fund like we passed or SWIFT or that, that's, that's state agency, that's not influencing legislation. 
So, so you can hire a contractor to help you with that. I know that's really important. I, I'm, I'm proud of the work y'all did in 2019 on all of that and the, the work that you're that's doing. That's a very clear distinction I'm trying yes. to get for yes. intent because yes. there's difference Absolutely. in advocating for legislation. Now, there may be a legislative piece down the road right. versus getting support and building that network of communities right. that need that legislation. Fifth, and they can hire someone to do that at any this time. This is not, not, not impacted by this bill all right. at all. So that was no. clearly something I needed to hear on the record. If it's a no, that's okay. I could be a no on the vote. If that's a yes, I just want to make sure that that's clearly not in violation of your bill because that is something every community, but smaller communities combined, need support because the process needs that network of information working before they ever show up down here. And that's why we were very specific on influencing the outcome of legislation, right, directly and directly. So we would we'd cover you on that. Yeah. Thank you. Senator Johnson, for what purpose do you rise? A few point, quick points of clarification, Mr. President. Uh, for the chair or for the author? For the author. Does the gentleman yield? I do. I do. He yields. Unless the chair prefers that I address the chair. <laughs> no preference there. Uh, Senator Milton, I just want to clarify, if, in case it was lost in the muddle, there was a considerable amount of words exchanged on the question of whether or not the state of Texas hires lobbyists to go to Washington. What we have is a website from the United States Senate showing very clearly that the lobbying firms of Cassidy & Associates, DLA Piper, Ogilvy Government Relations and the Ferguson Group have all been hired by the Office of State Federal Relations of Texas. So as a, as a point of clarity, Texas does this in Washington, period, and yet we're saying cities can't do it in Texas. I just want to make sure that everyone understands that's the approach we're taking here. That, what you're talking about right now, is the same as what our state agencies do with political, like we just had the discussion with Senator Perry, exact same situation, where the state is working on the Harvey money. That's a good example, actually. Um, obviously, that would, there a lot went into that. Um, buyouts. Are you saying they're not lobbying, basically? That we're hiring lobbying firms it's, to it's not lobby? It's the same situation as working with the state agencies as the federal, right? in conjunction with our political subdivisions of the state. And I think it's gonna get really difficult to start drawing lines between what's lobbying, what's not lobbying. Final point, we've already talked about charter schools and non-charter public schools, but it could well be that after this session, we're using public taxpayer dollars to provide vouchers for grade school education at private schools, and they will be allowed to lobby. And no doubt they will be lobbying for more vouchers and yet the public schools won't. Problem, not a problem. Well, the public schools are making their voice heard because they have government relations employees. They have associations. Why don't the private they schools have, hire government they, relations employees? They have employees. trustees. The private schools are private entities, just they, like the different groups that we talked about that are funded with our state budget under SB1. Like and corporations that could hire lobbyists. HB1. It's the same. They're private entities. We're, we're treating... There's the step in between because that money's not going directly to the private schools, by the way. No, it's filtered, right? So, so but, but we still is, have public education systems and private education systems that are supposed to educate the public under two different sets of rules. It's untenable. It's bad policy. I won't need to speak on third reading. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Milton moves suspension of the regular order of business. Will the secretary call the roll? Alvarado, Bencourt, Birdwell, Blanco, Campbell, Creighton, Eckhart, Flores. There being 19 ayes and 12 nays, the rules are suspended. The chair lays out on second reading. Senate Bill 175, will the secretary read the caption? Committee substitute Senate Bill 175, relating to the use by a political subdivision of public funds for lobbying and certain other activities. The following amendment. Will the secretary read the amendment? Floor amendment number one by Flores et al.
Senator Flores is recognized on amendment number one. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, this amendment, uh, what it proposes uh, as it presented to you, uh, amendment for committee substitute uh, Senate Bill 175 is as follows. In section one of the bill, immediately following added section 556.0056C, government code, page one between lines 48 and 49, insert the following appropriately lettered subsection. This section does not prohibit a full-time employee of a nonprofit state association or organization that primarily represents political subdivisions of the state from providing legislative services, including services related to bill tracking, bill analysis, and legislative alerts, communicating directly with a member of the legislature to provide information, or testifying for or against legislation before a legislative committee. So what it does, it, uh, it helps uh, our, to, for those that are nonprofit to associations, and those are associations like TAC, like TML, like the county judges and commissioners, to continue uh, serving our, our communities, our, our counties and cities, uh, and uh, that is the extent of that amendment, members. Senator Eckhart, for what purpose do you rise? To ask questions of the author of the amendment. Does the gentleman yield? I do. He yields. Thank you so much. Um, Senator, I like your amendment. And it doesn't change or alter in any way Senator Middleton's bill uh, prohibiting spending public funds to join these associations, correct? Uh, that I would have to assume that that's correct. Senator Middleton? I'm sorry, may he ask uh, the question? Why don't we, uh, are you done asking questions of the author of the amendment? Customarily, we would have questions of the author of the amendment, and then we would ask the author if, he's, if it's acceptable to him. If that's okay, just to... Very much. So I, I believe, I, I do like your amendment, and that's the only question that I had for the author of the amendment. So may I ask, uh, I, I now rise to ask questions of the author of the bill with respect to the amendment. That's not an order, not an order at this time, but we will come back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. And the amendment is acceptable to the author. Uh, Senator Menendez, for what purpose do you rise? A uh, question of the author of the amendment, Senator Flores. Does the gentleman yield? I do. He yields. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Flores. I was reading your amendment, and so I've read it, and, and uh, it's very prescriptive, and I, and I think it's a good amendment. I, I'm just curious, sometimes when we are creating an exemption, this section does not prohibit a full-time employee of a nonprofit state association or organization are there specific organizations that this amendment is drafted to cover, to help, uh, so well, that they're would not? Be, yes, Senator, it, that this, uh, it would be a, a nonprofit organization, and, those, okay. and so that's kind of descriptive of like TAC or a TML or examples like the county judges and commissioners, which are nonprofit huh? and which are currently providing these services to our cities and counties. And uh, so that's kind of the bracket would, there. Would it non-profit. capture someone, let's say, like uh, the uh, Teachers Association? I, I believe, as uh, Senator Milton said earlier, that the Teachers Associations are paid Not for Not included by dues, already? Okay. By dues. So How about if they're a nonprofit. Nonprofit. Uh, yes, sir. How about uh, the school board, uh, TASB? Are they if, they're also excluded with this amendment? Okay. So... You're, what you're saying is it's, it's okay for these associations, these nonprofit state associations, organizations that primarily represent political subdivisions of the state. Okay. So. Which will be most of ours. Uh, I think you've food. got an amendment that, that is attempting to exclude some people that are currently working to help these, these groups. Is that what your effort is? What are you trying to do? That, those, to, that, that those that are nonprofit. Yeah. That are, that are aiding our municipalities and our counties, our county judges, our commissioners, to provide the, the services listed out in, in, in this amendment right. to, to be able to do so, Senator. Okay. Thank you very much. I think you have Thank a good you, amendment. Thank you, Senator. 
Senator, Senator Alvarado, for what purpose? To ask the author a few questions. The author of the amendment, okay. Do you yield? I yield. The author of the amendment or the author? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, not on the amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Middleton, you're recognized on the amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Members, uh, I support this amendment. Uh, it was brought by Senator Flores and uh, a few other members where, you know, we heard a lot of discussion in committee and state affairs where uh, we had a number of, especially small counties, small cities, uh, other political subdivisions of the state. None of them really talked about great things by contract lobbyists, but they did talk about some of the things that are covered in this bill, in this amendment, sorry, about providing legislative services, bill tracking, bill analysis, communicating directly with members of the legislature, and testifying for and against legislation before a committee. So uh, I think that's important to point out. The other thing that's important to point out is this amendment does strike one of the provisions that was in the original as-filed bill, which is it leaves chapter 81 and 89 the same. Um, and what that means is that that particular provision only applied to counties, Texas Association of Counties. And I will point out one more thing uh, that this amendment highlights, and this is important here. Um, since 1987, there's been a provision in 8902 that says that neither the association, so this is Texas Association of Counties, nor an employee of the association can directly or indirectly influence the outcome of legislation pending before the legislature, uh, except they may be invited to appear before a legislative committee. We strike that because it brings it into this amendment, Texas Association of Counties, that then allows them uh, to take positions on legislation. So we're actually improving their position <laughs> with this amendment. Uh, I don't think that was really picked up in committee, but that's what this amendment does. Senator, Senator Eckhart, for what purpose? To ask questions of the author of the bill about the amendment and how it affects the okay. bill. Okay, all right. You're <laughs> uh, do you yield? I yield. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for walking me through that procedurally. Um, with regard to the amendment, uh, the amendment does not change any obligation of these associations to register any of its employees as lobbyists or uh, contractors, uh, uh, any of their contractors' obligations to register as lobbyists, correct? It, it does not apply to full-time employees, so that's what this does. This is an exemption for full-time employees, but it does apply to the hired gun lobbyists just as it does to the direct hire of hired gun lobbyists by political subdivisions of the state. And this amendment does not change your bill's prohibition on utilizing public funds to join these associations or to uh, participate on their boards or committees. They can still use public funds to join the associations, yes. As long as they don't have contract lobbies. That's the hired gun contract lobbies. That's the qualifier there. I don't see that that is changed by this uh, this amendment. It is, it's an exemption. So what this is, is it doesn't prohibit. So in other words, you're carved out of this section, which is the main section of the bill, dealing with public funds going to both chapter 305 lobbyists, as well as nonprofit associations that have contract lobbyists under chapter 305. I see that it, I see that it is added underneath section B, but it doesn't change Section A, a political subdivision, may not spend public funds on an association that primary, primarily represents political subdivisions and hires or contracts. So you're saying as long as the association does not contract with anyone who must register as a lobbyist, you're good to send good. public yes, funds. Yes, exactly. Yes. Public funds can go to them as long as they don't do that. Right. What, what if the association hires a law firm that hires a lobbyist? As long as they're a full-time employee, they're exempt. If they're a law firm, that is, and the individual is a registered lobbyist, it's not allowed. So in other words, the way Chapter 305 works, it's based on the individual. It's not based on the entity, right? So you could even have a, a lobbying company that has someone, an employee, that's not a registered lobbyist, and that's an allowed expenditure because lobbying is based on the individual. It's based on compensation of $1,760 per quarter 
and more than 40 hours per quarter in influencing the outcome of legislation. So our lobby laws are always based on the individual and not the entity. So that's going to be permissible as long as the association hires a law firm and the law firm has an affiliation with a lobbying group, you're good. They can hire the law firm as long as the individual that's working for them is not a registered lobbyist. And that explains how that explains how we do it at the state, actually, right? It's because somewhat we similar have a, to, the, to working with state agencies, mm -hmm. federal agencies. So the governor's office contracts with a DC law firm, and that DC law firm has an affiliate relationship with a lobbying group. Well, our Chapter 305 and the federal lobbying laws are totally different, um, and that's another reason why you can't combine those into one bill. So totally different registration requirements, totally different thresholds, totally different. Chapter 305 is completely separate under the government code. And, and I just want clarity that uh, Senator Flores' amendment makes it possible for local governmental entities to contract or to, to uh, use public funds to be a member of these associations, and as long as the association is hiring a law firm to then hire the lobbyist, you're good. That's correct, as long as that individual that they're contracting with is not a registered lobbyist, so yes. Okay, sounds like a workaround to me. Senator Milton on the amendment, he's already laid out the amendment. amendment is it acceptable, is acceptable to the author or not? Acceptable to the author. Okay, any objection members? Hearing none, amendment is adopted. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Senator Middleton, you're, oh, there's another amendment. Secretary will read the amendment. Floor amendment number two by Springer. Senator Springer on your amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, members, this amendment uh, is basically the same as we did the last session when uh, Senator Betancourt had the bill that dealt with our military bases. Um, our military bases uh, for many of our communities are just absolutely vital. Uh, this allows those cities and counties to be able to make sure that if they need to have their military bases represented, whether that's either, usually it's in the budget, but sometimes there are some operational reasons that they do it as well. Uh, and the uh, amendment is acceptable to the author, is my understanding. Senator Johnson, what purpose? Question of the author of the amendment. Do you yield? Yes, I yield. Uh, did I hear you correctly that these are complex questions being addressed? It, uh, so the purpose of the amendment, it sounded like, is the, because the these purpose are difficult of the amendment, questions. Uh, the purpose of the amendment, I s said, was that to our communities, these military bases are, are vital uh, jobs. I personally have Wichita Falls. I know Senator Menendez has all the ones in San Antonio. Um, and that they are seeking unique, different things that we want to make sure that, as Senator Gutierrez said last time, that they're able to... Uh, uh, advocate for. Critically important facilities these communities, highly complex questions, so you want them to be able to hire lobbyists to make sure the interests of those communities are preserved, right? And we're talking about BRAC closures, potential base closing, yes. Thank you. Senator Menendez, what purpose? Thank you, Mr. President, to uh, ask a question of the author of the amendment for this excellent amendment. Do you yield? I yield. Thank you, Mr. Spr uh, Senator Springer. I appreciate you bringing the amendment forward. Um, yes, this is an amendment that we've seen before on le similar legislation. Uh, as you mentioned in your layout, uh, Senator Gutierrez added this amendment. Um, you know, the state of Texas has, if I'm not mistaken, 14 military installations uh, that generate billions of dollars to the state. And so it is critically important for us when issues relating to base realignment and closures, when it's relating to issues of new missions that we uh, can hire, who we need to hire to interact with the Department of Defense and with uh, whoever it is we need to hire. And, and so I appreciate your amendment. I, it, it, is, um, it is critically important for us to continue to be uh, the state that welcomes the most military, active military and veterans and retired military families in the nation. And so um, I think it's a good amendment and, 
and I and I appreciate you offering it. Thank you. I appreciate your kind words and uh, apologies to those. I know many of the members would have easily wanted to sign on to this, uh, but in the speed and pace, uh, was unable to get those around to everybody. Senator Middleton on the amendment. Uh, it's acceptable with the author. Any objection? Hearing none. Amendment is adopted. You recognize pass the bill to engrossment. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, I move passage to engrossment of committee substitute to Senate Bill 175. Secretary, recall the roll. Alvarado, Betancourt, Birdwell. 19 ayes, 12 nays. The bill passed to engrossment. We'll hold there. Members, we have one resolution. It's a memorial resolution. If I can have you take your seats, and then we will break. The chair lays out the following resolution. The secretary will read the resolution. Senate Resolution 395 by Hancock and Parker. Whereas the Senate of the State of Texas honors and commemorates the life of Patricia Carla Rogers, who died on March 30th, 2023, at the age of 63. And whereas countless lives were touched by the kindness and generosity of Patty Rogers, whose rich and meaningful life was filled with gratitude, love, and joyful purpose. Led by her servant's heart, she faithfully served as a teacher, role model, and mentor to Mindy, and was a beloved wife, mother, grandmother, and friend. And whereas born on January 23, 1960, Patricia Rogers was an exemplary Texas citizen and an esteemed member of her community. She led a rewarding career as an educator for three decades, and she served as an elementary school teacher in the Birdville and Grapevine Colleyville Independent School Districts, where she was respected and admired by her students and colleagues. And whereas truly dedicated to her calling in education and in serving others, Patty made a positive difference in the lives of innumerable school children, teachers, and families through her compassionate encouragement and her skillful guidance as an educator. Over the course of her teaching career, she received recognition for her accomplishments and for her outstanding commitment to education, which included being awarded Teacher of the Year for the Grapevine Colleyville Independent School District. And whereas Patty was a devoted wife and mother and a cherished daughter, sister, and grandmother, she raised her children by loving, faithful example, and they were a source of great pride and joy in her life. Patty was also blessed with grandchildren whom she adored and who enriched her life immeasurably. A dear friend to so many, Patty played an integral role in the lives of her loved ones, and she was a source of inspiration and light in the lives of those around her. And whereas a woman of loyalty, strength, and grace, Patty's bright and joyous spirit was appreciated by all who knew her, and her contributions to her community and to the field of elementary education in Texas leave a lasting legacy of excellence and service. Her love for her family and her dedication to serving others will not be forgotten, and her memory will be forever treasured by her family and by all who were privileged to share her life. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Senate of the State of Texas, 88th Legislature, hereby extend sincere condolences to the bereaved family of Patricia Carla Rogers, and be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be prepared for her family as an expression of deepest sympathy from the Texas Senate, and that when the Senate adjourns this day, it do so in memory of Patty Rogers. Senator Hancock. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. And we've discussed this the other day, and in fact, uh, when you've known someone for over 50 years <laughs> and you hear their married name and you remember them because you went to school with them and knew them growing up uh, as Patty Mayberry, every time I hear Patty Rogers, I have to think that's Patty Mayberry. And so, yeah, I uh, appreciate you doing this resolution. Patty Rogers or Patty Mayberry, as, as I knew her growing up, uh, she was taken from this world way too early on March 30th in, in really a tragic accident just simply walking across the street with friends uh, after an event, um, a terrible accident. When, when people think about Patty, uh, I think they will think of the word service. We serve here. She served in her local community, uh, came back to teach in Birdville where she had gone to school and, and where her family knew so many people. We, uh, the Mayberries were well known um, 
in the Birdville district. She served her family. She was a good wife, almost 40 years, a mother of two daughters, and Gammy, as she liked to be called by grandchildren. Uh, she served countless children as an elementary school teacher, as you've heard, both in, Grape, in uh, Birdville and Grapevine Colleyville, which right next to each other. Um, and she was just known as being a great teacher, a great servant, um, really one of those individuals that everybody in the community knew uh, who Patty was. And so I'm, I'm stricken along with the family and our entire community. I uh, received text the, the day this happened from actually uh, folks here in Austin that work in the Capitol that uh, lived back home with us as well, knew her, because they just, everybody knew about Patty and her faith uh, and how strong that was for her. And obviously her family will be leaning on that now uh, with this tragic loss. And so I thank you for the opportunity, members, uh, to recognize um, a teacher, a mother, a grandmother that's no longer with us at such a young age. And we, we pray for her husband as well and the entire family. Thank you, Senator. And, you know, the, it was the 30th, which meant it was one week ago today. Just means all of us have to cherish life every day. We don't know what the next week brings for any of us or any of our loved ones. And a very sad accident, tragic accident for an incredible lady. Uh, members, uh, if you'll rise uh, in favor of the resolution. The resolution is adopted. Thank you, Senator. Members, we will break until 1.30. We'll recess until 1.30. Uh, and the reason, again, we are behind is we've had so many amendments turned in on Senate Bill 8 and 9, just organizing them. We hope to be ready at 1.30 to go with that bill. And uh, those two bills... I know that uh, we have a couple of announcements. Senator Hughes for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. President. For a motion. And, and thank you for providing us for a motion. Thank you. Uh, I move to suspend the posting rules to allow the Committee on State Affairs to meet upon adjournment in the press room to consider pending business. And I'll say, but we've asked Mr. President, there's multiple things going on. We'd ask State Affairs members to come there. If we can vote right away, we'll turn them loose for other responsibilities. Thank All you. All right. Any objection? Hearing none. Motion is adopted. Middleton. Senator Middleton. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, as a reminder, the Senate Subcommittee on Higher Education will convene today upon recess to take up committee business in E1028. Okay. Any objection? Hearing none. Oh, sorry, that was not a motion, just an announcement. Thank you. Yes, sir. Senator West? All right, what business are we going to take up? Just, you just said take up business. It, they're posted agenda. They're just getting an early start while we're on this break of the bills. They're, going to, they're posted agenda. They're posted agenda for the day. They're taking up some of the bills prior to DEI. So there are other bills in that committee they're going to start on so they can get a start for what will be a long committee day. Senator Whitmire for a motion. Okay. Sorry, Senator Hughes. Mr. President, parliamentary inquiry, are we adjourning or recessing? Recessing. May I then amend my motion? I think my motion was upon adjournment. Should I make that upon yes. recess? Yes. May I, may I be recognized for that motion? Yes. I move to suspend the posting rules to allow the Committee on State Affairs to meet upon recess in the press room to consider pending business. Thank you. I thank Senator Bettencourt for pointing it out. Thank you. Any objection? Hearing none. Motion is adopted. Senator Whitmire. President, I move we recess until 1.30 today. Any objection? Hearing none. We'll recess until 1.30. Thank you, members.